Hello friends, this is Fiction Domain. How are you all? So we are back with an interesting movie on what if Naruto was a world's most powerful demon with chakra power. But before we start, if you want more stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe and like this video. And if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. Of the five great ninja villages, the village hidden in the leaves was undoubtedly the greatest. Please excuse me. Haruka pressed his way through the mass of bodies, bound beneath the disapproving glares of the pale-eyed men and women that made up the branch house of the noble Haikta clan. Has anyone seen my student? Blonde hair, wears orange. Excuse me, I really am terribly sorry about all this. In order to bring an end to the senseless conflict of the warring clans era, the legendary first Hokage Senju Hashirama united the many clans in the land of fire by founding Kanahagakur, and in doing so introduced the unique concept of one shinobi village per country. Having a central base of operations for the nation's entire military presented a level of organization entirely unlike the chaotic clan warfare that had given the warring clans era its dark name. Iruka found his student flickering rapidly between the rooftops of the Haika clan's compound, to which entry was strictly forbidden even to respectable outsiders, let alone the orphan boy that had just invaded their territory. Yuzumaki Naruto. He cried out. Just what do you think you are doing? The boy let out a surprised yelp at the sound of Aruka's voice and promptly fell from the roof, only to land right on top of the white marble statue of Haika Hiyashi, the esteemed head of Kanoha's greatest remaining noble clan. Aruka winced internally at the sight, knowing full well who would receive the blame for this debacle in the end. It's okay. The boy chirped out. Bruises healed quickly. After the first Hokage's death his younger brother Senju Tabarama took up the title of second Hokage, founding the Ninja Academy and the Anbu, as well as establishing the rules and regulations that came to dominate shinobi life. So successful were these organizations that the other countries had no choice but to follow suit. In each and every case, Kanoha led the way, and the rest followed in their footsteps. Oh, Haruka-sensei. The boy exclaimed, noticing him for the first time. He clambered down from the statue, leaving it covered with muddy footprints. I was just gonna figure out how the body flicker technique worked, but then I kept going to see how many times I could cast it in a row, and I was just starting to run out of chakra when suddenly all these people started yelling at me and chasing after me like it's my fault these buildings all look the same from above. The boy stood up and dusted himself off, smearing more dirt onto his worn orange pants and jacket, while the whole army of frantic Haika branch members rushed to investigate the statue's damages. So what are you doing here, Haruka sensei Aren't you supposed to be teaching or something? Iruka stared at his student in disbelief. It's your class I'm supposed to be teaching, Yuzumaki Naruto. Oh right. The boy scratched the back of his head awkwardly. I guess I must have forgot. Of course, no great nation is without its enemies, and so it has been for Konoha. Three times the land of fire was embroiled in a ninja world war when the jealous countries of stone, sand, mist, and lightning sought to encroach upon Konoha's territory. However, Kanoha Shinobi fought back valiantly, and under the leadership of its heroic Hokages, they emerged triumphant every time. Yet after not even three years of hard-fought peace, the unsuspecting village was once again faced with an enemy, one more terrible than all those that had come before. For in the village there had appeared a mighty demon fox, a monstrous mass of pure chakra and malevolence that lashed out at all living things without reason or purpose, and its eyes was so great that its shadow cast all of Kanoha into darkness. One swing of its nine tails was enough to crumble mountains or cause tsunamis to rise up from the oceans. In order to fight. Excuse me, Iruka sensei A familiar student in the back row of the class was holding up his right hand to indicate a question, though since he continued speaking right away, he seemed to have missed the intended purpose of the gesture. If the kikbi was so big it could destroy mountains and stuff with its tails, and it was inside Kanoha for almost an hour, how come the village is still here? The village survived, Iruka explained irritably, because of the actions of the fourth Hokage, who nobly sacrificed himself in order to defeat the rampaging beast. You would have known that, Yuzumaki Naruto, if you had been paying attention at all in class this year. The blonde troublemaker was originally an orphan from the land of whirlpools, which had been destroyed shortly before the Kikbi's attack on Kanoha, and it was clear to Iruka that the boy had never quite managed to fit in. Moreover, there was something off about him, like a subtle underlying foulness to his chakra that instantly put Aruka on guard. About that Naruto said. Um. Did he really defeat the Kikbi all by himself? I mean, he had a whole army with him. Is it possible that some of the other ninja maybe helped him a little bit? He would discredit the fourth Hokage's legacy. Aruka was more astonished than angry, but even so, it was clear he would never become fond of this particular student. That infuriatingly cautious tone the boy used that said I don't think I'm smarter than you, honest was not exactly helping, either. Hiroka slammed his hand onto the table. 
The fourth Hokage was a great hero who sacrificed himself so that you might live, yet you deface his memory by questioning his heroism. The whole class was shooting dirty looks at Naruto now, and the boy rightly shrunk back in his seat in shame. Hiruka turned back to reading from his history scroll, satisfied that his student had been sufficiently rebuked. Hopefully this means I can actually finish the day's lesson plan for once. It was just another day in peaceful Konoha, in the land of fire, where the sun always shines. The day we are going to focus on our tojutsu, Haruka-sensei declared. Everyone pair up and practice sparring together. The ordinary-looking man Naruto would have trouble distinguishing him from any other black and green clad Chknin rank shinobi, if not for the horizontal scar running across his face, read from his lesson plan as he spoke. Naruto was not entirely sure why he needed the scroll, since tell students to practice hand-to-hand -hand combat seemed pretty easy even for him to remember, but it was probably safer not to ask. The class of 30 students and one teacher had gathered on an open field of dirt, an area which had been set up next to the massive round and red academy building, for the physical part of their ninja training. Usually there was more in the way of training equipment, but they had put that in the storage closet for today's exercise. The morning sun was shining brightly as it always did, and all around Naruto drowsy classmates were huddling together and pairing up. Naruto blinked, suddenly remembering that he was supposed to find a partner, and hastily looked around to see who was still unaccounted for. He walked up to one of the rougher-looking boys, Kiba most noticeable for the white dog he kept around wherever he went and pulled on his jacket as he walked past. Hey. Hey Kiba. Wanna spar? Beat it, Naruto. The taller boy wrinkled his nose at him before walking away, which Naruto thought was terribly unfair. He had bathed only two days ago, so he could hardly smell worse than the Inuzuka ninja clan that was set to sleep with their own dogs. Whenever he mentioned this fact some of the older students would burst out in laughter, but when Naruto asked why he never received any reply. Undaunted, he turned his attention to the next classmate he saw. Hey Ino. He waved at the heir of the Amanaka clan, but the most popular girl of the class barely even looked at him, only frowning slightly, as if examining a particularly curious insect before turning away. Thinking of insects, Naruto looked towards Shino, but the insect-controlling Aburam clan member was already teaming up with Kiba. He turned his hopes to Shikamaru, but the Nara clan heir was with Arat Unchoji as always. The two of them were pretending to train together, but in reality they were just chatting and gazing at the sparse clouds that drifted lazily along the sky. Ever since Aruka's outburst a few weeks ago, the other students had treated Naruto with even more disdain than before. Naruto was unsure what he had done that was so terrible to deserve this, but whatever it was, he resolved not to do it again. It was difficult to learn from your mistakes, however, when people got angry at you just for asking what you did wrong. He brightened up when he saw Sakura, a pretty girl with pink hair and a pink dress. Well, he thought she was pretty, anyway. Ino teased her for her large forehead, while others teased her for spending her free time in the library, peering over old scrolls. She could be mean sometimes, but she was one of the only people who talked to Naruto on any regular basis, which earned her a special place in his heart. Sakura-chan. He called out. Do you wanna? Out of the way, I have to get to Sasuke-kun before Ino does. She pushed past Naruto with such haste that he fell on his backside, squealing Sasuke's name as she ran up to him and began fawning over her one-sided crush. The last member of the Achiha clan seemed content with practicing alone, yet both Sakura and Ino were oblivious to the fact. They noticed that some of the other students were shooting envious looks at Sasuke as well. What's so special about that guy? My clan is gone too, but nobody ever seems to care about that. Yet even as he thought that, there was a part of Naruto that knew perfectly well that the genius heir of the Achiha clan was rich and handsome, and that he himself was not. As Naruto stood up and shook the dirt from his clothes, an idea occurred to him, and he walked up to the boy with a renewed sense of purpose. Sasuke. He yelled at the Achiha's back. Spar with me. The others immediately told him to bugger off, but Sasuke, surprisingly, did not. The taller boy calmly turned around, and when Naruto saw his eyes he almost stumbled again in shock. There was none of the contempt there that he had expected, only a cool expression of perfect emptiness. Those black eyes calmly looked him over and then turned away without as much as a single word. Naruto's mouth slowly opened and closed again. He stood there wordlessly as Sasuke went back to practicing his tojutsu moves while the others went back to fawning over him. It was one thing to be ignored, Naruto thought, but being looked at like that and then dismissed as nothing was somehow even worse. Without pausing to think about it, he kneeled down and scooped up a handful of muddy dirt and flung it directly at the back of Sasuke's head. It impacted his sparkly clean jet black hair with a wet splorch, a sound which was immediately followed by deathly silence. Fight me, Naruto said, repeating his challenge. Naruto. Yelled Sakura and Ino and the others echoed her as well. How dare you ruin Sasuke-kun's luster's hair. 
She started to advance upon Naruto with rage writ on her face, but was shocked to see Sasuke hold out an arm to stop her. No Sakura. Naruto clearly wants his duel very badly. Ichiha Sasuke turned around to face him, and Naruto ground his teeth in frustration when he saw that his expression was exactly the same as it was before. The only difference was the mud in his hair, which he left there untouched, apparently not bothered by it in the slightest. I shall give it to him. Naruto hesitated, unsure where to go from there. Um. First to hit the ground loses. Sure, said Sasuke, putting both of his hands in his pockets. Ready when you are. Okay, said Naruto, who felt his confidence drained by the second. Um. Go. He lunged at Sasuke, but the Ichiha simply stepped sideways, and Naruto missed him by a mile. The second punch was thrust at Sasuke's face, but his opponent merely titled his head sideways to dodge. I'm sorry, said Sasuke. Did you say go yet? I think I might have missed it. There was cruel after coming from all around him, and Naruto felt his face turn red with building pressure. Shut up. He yelled, as Sasuke dodged a high kick. Stand still, and fight back. You are very demanding, said Sasuke, but as you wish. When Naruto's next blow came, he pulled one hand out of his pocket and grabbed Naruto's wrist, twisting it sideways. Naruto shrieked in pain, a high-pitched sound that only elicited more laughter, and then Sasuke gave a sharp pull that yanked Naruto forwards until his mouth tasted dirt. This means I win, right? The laughter seemed to continue forever, lasting deep into eternity. As it went on the sound became distorted. Their scorn pressed in on Naruto from all sides, their ridicule burrowing through his ears like worms and penetrating deep into his body, and there in the darkness it awakened a smoldering anger. The training grounds vanished. The space around him twisted and bent, the air pulsating as though with heat, until only the narrow figure of Ichiha Sasuke remained within his field of vision. Naruto launched himself at him right as Sasuke walked away, and the Ichiha only barely turned in time to defend against the ferocious assault. This time Sasuke had to take both hands from his pockets, but still he fended Naruto off easily, knocking each of his punches away with the flat of his palms. He's more skilled than me, gotta catch him off guard and use his instincts against him. Naruto yelled at the top of his lungs and launched a sweeping kick towards Sasuke in a round arc. Right when Sasuke made to grab for the proffered leg, Naruto threw his full weight backwards and pulled the limb back in, even as he kicked his other foot upwards towards the enemy's face. There was the briefest satisfying moment where Naruto could see Sasuke's eyes widen in shock and spinning. Interesting, he remembered him saying, and then Naruto was lying flat on his back, pain flaring through his body where his spine struck the ground. But the what just? What the heck was that? For just one moment he had seen Sasuke's eyes change, becoming the color of blood and growing a second pupil shaped like a comma in each eye. Naruto tried to scramble away, but he was immediately kicked in the side, pain surging through his ribs as he collapsed back onto the soil. No, you're not getting off that easily. Sasuke was idly fingering a kunai, which he had pulled from nowhere. Naruto looked at the knife in fear, his anger draining away only to be replaced with raw terror. That's enough, said the voice of Sakura, worry permeating her voice. Sasuke-kun, you've won the duel. You don't have to go any further. Oh, but I do. Sasuke's foot came down hard on Naruto's shoulder, and he cried out in pain, even as Sasuke clutched his kunai and dravi downwards. Naruto shut his eyes in horror, but he only felt cold iron brush against the skin of his arm. He stabbed the knife through the sleeve of my jacket, he realized with faint relief. You see, Sakura, Sasu continued, what you just saw was no duel. This boy attacked me, the heir to the Ichiha clan, while my back was turned. He slammed his foot onto Naruto's left shoulder and repeated the procedure of before. A crime that, I think you'll agree, should not go unpunished. He's only a kid, Sakura protested feebly. I'm sure he's learned his lesson. I'm sure he has, but that's not really enough, now is it? Sasu came for Naruto's legs and did the same there, pinning his right pant leg to the ground with another kunai. Naruto did not even dare kick out at him, terrified as he was that Sasu could accidentally stab him as a result. This boy attacked me out of pure jealousy. He saw that I had something which he lacked, and like a common brigand he sought to take it from me. The last kunai was driven in, leaving Naruto completely pinned to the ground and helpless. It is only appropriate that I take something equally valuable from him instead, he finished, as he produced a fifth and final kunai from the pouch on his hip. Enough, said Sakura, sounding as though it took all of her courage just to say that one word. When Naruto craned his neck he saw that she was holding Sasuke by one arm, stopping him from going any further, a dangerous look on her face. You've made your point now let him go. The last of the Ichiha stared at Sakura for a moment, but then a small smile appeared on his face, and he visibly relaxed. As you wish. I did not realize that he mattered so much to you, Sakura. There was some scattered laughter, and Sakura's cheeks flushed crimson. He most certainly does not. Oh? 
Sasuke shrugged and, holding the tip of his knife between two fingers, flicked it high up into the air. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Time seemed to stop as the blade arced higher and higher until it hung still directly above Naruto's prone form. Then it started falling. He tried to move out of the way, but only succeeded in cutting his arms and legs on the daggers that held him in place. Sakura tried to intercept the knife, but the last he saw before he closed his eyes was Sasuke holding her back. I'm gonna die I'm gonna die I'm gonna die. There was a thunk and Naruto slowly opened his eyes, dreading to see which body part had been impaled. Instead, when he raised his head to look, he found the blade lying on the ground between his legs, right below his groin. It was a practice kunai, the kind that was used by students to spar blunt and light and less dangerous than your average stick. The warm wetness pooling inside his pants wasn't blood then, he concluded faintly. There was more laughter then, hesitant at first but growing ever louder as the built-up tension was released. Even Sasuke was smirking, and in his black eyes, there was a twinkle of mirth. I was only joking around, Naruto. You didn't really think I was going to hurt you, did you? And honestly, you're lucky you got off so lightly, Sakura continued unabated. I mean. Once Sasu comes of age he'll be the Lord Achiha, and you attacked him out of petty spite. They could have executed you, for that. Naruto stared at the empty scroll on his desk and said nothing. After the first few times having Sakura scold him he had gotten too tired to argue with her. The worst part was that he really could have gotten into serious trouble if not for Sasuke assuring Aruka-sensei that it had only been an intense sparring session, which had gotten slightly out of hand. Somehow, Naruto only hated him more for doing that. And anyway, you have to bear in mind his childhood, Sakura went on, her voice dropping to a whisper as she spoke. Anybody would have been affected by what happened to him and to his entire clan. Naruto glumly looked at the back of the Achiha heir, who was sitting next to Ino today, much to Sakura's chagrin. In truth, Naruto did not really know what had happened to Sasuke's clan, though of course he had heard all the rumors by now. The most common story that went around and the one that was repeated by officials was that Sasuke's now infamous brother Ichiha Itachi had gone mad and killed everybody in the middle of the night, murdering an entire clan of elite shinobi single-handedly, despite how unlikely that seemed. Then there were those who claimed it had been the ghost of Ichiha Madara, returned from the grave to punish his clan for turning their backs on him. Others insisted that the entire clan had been cursed by the spirits for their sins, or that they had been involved in a demonic blood ritual that ended up consuming their lives, and the stories only grew more incredible from there. His thoughts were disturbed by the opening of the classroom door, through which stepped a young Chiknin with shoulder-length white hair. The man softly closed the door behind him and walked up to the teacher's desk, looking for all the world like he belonged there. Who are you? Inuzuka Kiba demanded. Where's Iruka sensei my name is Mizuki, and I am your substitute teacher, the man replied calmly. I'm afraid Aruka-sensei has taken some well-deserved time off, it seems he has been working very hard lately, and teaching this class has been quite stressful to him. A smile flitted across his face. Although, if I'm perfectly honest I suspect it's mostly one specific blonde student who has been giving him difficulty as of late. There was some scattered laughter then, and Naruto felt blood rushing to his face. He's just the same as all the others, he thought bitterly. Kiba did not appear to be placated either, as he huffed and turned around in his seat, facing away from the substitute teacher. Naruto couldn't blame him. Iruka might not have been a great teacher, but at least he had been their bad teacher. I have been reviewing Iruka-sensei's lesson plans with great interest, Mizuki went on. I believe I see room for changes to better fit my personal approach to teaching. From now on, I intend to adjust the lessons to your individual abilities, letting go of the more conventional approach in order to. So I was thinking of going out to the Akaniku Q tonight, Kiba proclaimed loudly. I hear their salted beef tongue hits the spot, but anything with red meat will do. Ain't that right, Akamaru? His white canine yapped happily in response. The teacher paused, looking at Kiba as though waiting for him to stop talking to his dog. Naruto winced internally. The Inuzuka were said to be half feral themselves. They tended to act on instinct, and challenging the alpha was both first and second nature to them. If this new teacher did not prove himself somehow, there would not be much done in the way of teaching before the final academy exams arrived. The man cleared his throat. I'm sorry, but I really cannot allow any discussion in the classroom while I teach. A single remark may seem harmless enough, but each comment invites further discussion from the others until the entire class becomes disrupted as a result. I trust you understand. Yeah, sure, whatever. Kiba waved his hand in a vague gesture that might have been anything from a polite greeting to a mortal insult. The white-haired man was apparently satisfied with this response because he turned back to the class and continued his lecture from where he left off. Not even ten seconds later, Kiba started talking again, louder than before. The Inuzuka were not a clan particularly given to subtlety, Naruto reflected. 
The entire class was watching the new teacher now, waiting with bated breath to see how he would react. Mizuki's face twitched, and Naruto knew what was coming next. Any second now the teacher would blow up, screaming in frustration, just like Aruka sensei always did when he lost control of the class. But instead Mizuki visibly relaxed and calmly walked up to where Kiba sat. I am truly very sorry, he said, his voice now dripping with honey. I realize this is my fault I should have remembered to get to know my students better before starting the lesson. Your name is Inuzuka Kiba, isn't it? The fear-looking boy said nothing, but Naruto could see him tense up. You know, I met your mother earlier this week. She seemed a very lively woman. She had quite some good advice to give on dog rearing, too along the lines of how a timely clip around the ears can help keep an unruly pup in line. Laughter rose up around the classroom as Kiba sputtered something inaudible, and his face turned a dark shade of red, but the teacher was not done yet. Then she invited me into her room for a late night drink, but I had to politely refuse since I'm allergic and I was worried I'd get a nasty rash. It was a moment of silence as those words sank in, and then the entire room exploded into raucous laughter. Kiba meanwhile was turning purple, and Naruto half expected him to leap out of his seat and attack the teacher then and there, but to his amazement, Kiba sat back down and gave the white-haired man a look of almost grudging respect. Mizuki waited patiently for the laughter to die down, but when it became clear that was not going to happen, he picked up a glass of water from his desk and threw it down onto the floor. Shards of glass flew in every direction, and the class hurriedly ducked behind their desks, instantly falling silent with shock. The teacher coughed politely, as though that was all it had taken to get their attention. I realize it's easy to underestimate the gap in knowledge between what is assumed and what is actually known, but I would hope that a class of ninjas is at least familiar with the basic concept of subterfuge. There are more places to hide than in the shadows. The most powerful sensing techniques may be foiled by suppressing your chakra and dressing like a common servant, and some of the greatest assassinations performed in the history of the leaf might as well have been executed by a mere civilian. There was a pause as his gaze went over the speechless class. In short, if you wish to be strong you must be able to pretend to weakness, and you need to be able to recognize this quality in others as well. If I am forced to be your teacher I will make sure you learn at least that much. The entire class was hanging on his lips now, and what followed was the most intense classroom lecture Naruto had ever experienced. In truth, what Mizuki discussed was not all that different from Aruka's usual material, and many of the things he said were things Naruto already knew. But when Mizuki-sensei spoke, it was as though everything he said had meaning. Instead of reading from a book, he seemed to choose every word with a specific intention and purpose, and every single student sat upright in their seats and listened. And so it was that when the lecture ended, Naruto was still there after all the other students had left, standing alone before the teacher's unadorned wooden desk. The man smiled congenially at him. Naruto, was it? What can I do for you? Naruto scratched the back of his head. I just want to ask that thing you did, making fun of Kiba to get everyone's attention. Um. How did you know that was gonna work? It's just a matter of instinct. The man shrugged. I knew Kiba was the biggest troublemaker, so by making an example of him, I could get the rest to fall in line. Right, said Naruto, nodding along. Only I tried to imagine someone like Aruka sensei doing the same, and I just can't see it working for him. Like, he always yelled and threatened to punish us a lot, but then he'd turn around, and everyone would just go back to doing what they wanted. So how come it works when you do it? Oh, so you want to know my secret, eh? Naruto nodded eagerly, and the man leaned forward to whisper in his ear. It's intent. You see, people can usually tell when you're bluffing, so the trick to get them to listen to you is simple. Never bluff. Always make sure that you have a backup plan, and never hesitate to carry it out if you have to. Naruto frowned. But then what would you have done if Kiba had just ignored you? Ah. Well, I suppose in that case I would have had to throw Kiba out of the window. Naruto recoiled, and the man chuckled at his shocked reaction. Oh, don't act so alarmed. Ninja are not that fragile, and even if he had gotten hurt the Inuzuka would not have made a big deal out of it, they handle their own disputes in much the same way, after all. In fact, Kiba would probably have respected me more for it. But, but, wouldn't that have gotten you in trouble with the other teachers? And, um, everybody else. The corners of Mizuki's lips twitched. Oh, probably. Most likely, yes, they would have talked ill of me behind my back and tried to have me dismissed. But I've already acquired a certain reputation, and the alternative would have been a very unpleasant school year where you don't actually learn anything. I find that people are often far more troubled by a small immediate loss than long-term failure, well the opposite should be the case. Mizuki paused for a moment, as if considering something. Then, he smiled conspiratorially. Listen, Naruto-kun. I can tell you a story to help explain what I mean, if you like, but you have to promise to keep it a secret. Can you do that for me? Naruto nodded. I promise. 
The man leaned back in his seat, his gray eyes glistening over in remembrance. Many years ago, before I became a teacher, I was sent on a mission along with an old friend of mine and another Kanoha shinobi. We had to deliver very sensitive information to a certain location, and I was told that the task was of vital importance. I can't give you the details, but suffice to say that the enemy got wind of it, and they ambushed us. Since our mission was to deliver the information no matter what, we decided to make a break for it. At first it seemed that we'd get away, but at the last moment a shuriken struck our new team member in the leg, and he collapsed. I told my friend that we had to keep going to fulfill our mission, but he insisted on carrying him while we ran. How well do you think that worked out, Naruto-kun? Naruto considered this. Ninjas were very strong and fast while flaring their chakra, but it seemed unlikely that they could keep that up for very long. Not well. Not well indeed. The enemy was catching up to us, and it was becoming increasingly clear that we wouldn't be getting away with him slowing us down like that. I told my friend as much, but he yelled at me that I should take over carrying the wounded man, even though this would result in us all being captured and tortured by the enemy. So what do you think I did? You convinced your friend that he didn't have a choice. You made him leave the man behind. Bazuki smiled again, though it no longer reached his eyes. That's right, I convinced him the only way I knew how. I agreed to take over, then took my kunai and slit the wounded man's throat before leaving him behind. My friend had no choice but to face reality then, and we both slipped away and completed the mission safely, but even so he never forgave me for it. He told everyone in the village what I did, and after that nobody ever really trusted me again. I saved my friend, I completed the mission, and all I had to give up for it was a man who was already dead, but even though I followed the shinobi rules and did exactly what I was supposed to, everyone acted like it was my fault he died. As if the fact that I was the one holding the kunai made me responsible for his death, while my friend was innocent simply because he refused to accept responsibility. Afterwards, nobody trusted me on their team again, and it took me years to even get this teacher's position. Does that seem fair to you, Naruto? Naruto felt himself turning pale. No no, it doesn't. Bazuki stared out of the window, a morose expression on his face. There are two groups of ninja in this village, he said at last. The first likes to act nice and speaks of lofty ideals like the will of fire, but they never assume responsibility for the consequences of their actions. The second group has a certain quality that lets them handle the unpleasant tasks that the others don't want to be associated with a quality known as darkness, and they do this, even though they know they will always be hated for it. Naruto followed Mizuki's gaze through the window to see if he could perhaps find this darkness his teacher spoke of. But outside, the sun was shining as brightly as it always had, and the birds were singing with not a care in the world. It was three weeks before the Ninja Academy graduation exams when Naruto was finally forced to admit that he was critically behind on his studies, having failed the last three preliminary tests in a row. Naruto knew he desperately needed to study, and yet his Academy scrolls obstinately refused to be read. He had tried reading them backwards or while hanging upside down, tried skipping every second sentence, even giving up entirely and walking out of the room, only to quickly run back to his scroll before his brain realized it was being tricked. As well as countless other less sensible and well thought out measures, all to no avail. His brain would take one look at the academy mandated material and declare that it would rather do something else thank you very much and to hell with Naruto's own stated views on the matter. Every time he tried to focus on the subject material, a million unrelated thoughts would pop up that all somehow seemed so much more interesting anything to delay having to study for just a moment longer. Seeing an opportunity to use this to his advantage, Naruto had already cleaned his room, well, cleaned by his standards, done his morning exercises, written an essay on knitting, practiced balancing books on his head while hopping on his left foot, studied the fine art of origami cooked a meal and then ate half of it before deciding he wasn't hungry after all, and leaving the rest to stew on his desk as an impromptu biology experiment. Finally, driven by purest desperation, he had forced himself to ask for studying assistance from the one person he was certain would never refuse that particular request. So it was that on a lazy summer afternoon, the orange-clad ninja was standing on the porch of a humble but tidy-looking house, with blue window blinds and a potted plant next to the door. Even then, standing on the doorstep of the building, it was still strangely difficult to take that final step and knock on the door. Naruto ran a nervous hand through the messy blonde hair on the back of his head. This is stupid. I am a ninja or training to be one anyway. If I am gonna risk my life in mortal combat, I should be able to ask a girl for help. With those words on his mind and cursing inwardly, Naruto forced himself to knock. Humming. There was a series of muffled footfalls thundering down the stairs, followed by the sound of a security chain being removed on the other side. The door swung open to reveal a bright and happy face framed by pink hair, with a forehead that was often called overlarge, but which Naruto thought looked kind of cute. 
Sakura was wearing a red Jiangsum that fell to her knees, as well as dark green shorts. Her face fell almost immediately upon seeing him. Oh, it's just you. For a moment there I thought you were Ino, or better yet, Sasuke. Her expression glazed over as her mind wandered wistfully for a moment before reluctantly turning back to reality. You wanted help preparing for the academy exams, right? I suppose you might as well come in now that you're here. Uh, thanks. Wait hold on one moment. No sooner had Naruto taken one step into the building or he was forced back outside by Sakura's pointed finger of accusation. This isn't one of those stupid tricks where you're pretending to ask for help with your exams, but really you're just trying to get close to me, until one day I drop my guard and let you into my heart, is it? Naruto threw up his hands defensively. No, I just wanted you to help me study, I swear. A thought occurred to him then. Wait, where did you even get that idea from? Have you been reading romance novels? You haven't been reading any of Jiraiya's stupid books, have you? No more questions. She grabbed him by the arm and dragged him into the entrance hall, past the kitchen of motherly shouting oh are you bringing a friend how nice wait is that a boy okay well yell if you need anything. Up the stairs and straight into the bedroom of supreme pinkness. My parents decorated it that way when I was a little girl, she said defensively. Shut up. I didn't say anything. He had been thinking it, though. Naruto tried to be tolerant with regards to girlishness, but there were limits and they had been crossed right where the walls began. Almost everything in the room that was not pink was flowery, curly, laced, or some combination of all three. Sit down. She pointed towards a plain wooden chair right in the middle of the sparkly clean wooden flooring. He sat himself there as ordered, half expecting a team of pink-clad Anbu interrogators to come into the room and stand in a circle around the chair while she questioned him. Sakura seated herself on the bed opposite him, legs folded underneath in a meditative posture, a book having manifested in her hand. It was not hard to imagine where she got it from. Aside from girlishness, the other thing the room was filled with to the brim was scrolls and books. The shelves above her bed seemed to have been occupied by dolls and stuffed animals once, but over the years the forces of girlishness had been steadily losing ground to the invading armies of book mania. Now the plush animals were looking to make a desperate last stand, forced to choose between being trod underneath unyielding leather bindings or to leap to the soft linen doom promised by the bed covers below. Okay. Let's start by testing what you know, so we get an idea of how much catching up we need to do. She leafed through the book at rapid speed, flipping the pages as though it were second nature to her. First question. If the area of a right triangle is 30 and one of its angles is 45 degrees, what are the lengths of the sides and hypotenuse of the triangle? Uh, I don't think we need to practice that kind of stuff for the academy exams, he pointed out. Wait, is that a chknin exam question? Why are you learning chknin level material when we haven't even graduated the academy yet? Sakura stared at him in astonishment. Naruto, the academy mandated curriculum may be necessary, but it's not sufficient to become a well-informed citizen with a half-decent understanding of the world he lives in. If you don't learn even basic mathematics like this, how can you expect to help teach at the academy once you become older, or research new techniques or study the nature of chakra? I don't, he said with a shrug that made his chair wobble. I just want to learn what I need to pass this stupid exam so I can hurry up and become a legal adult, learn all kinds of powerful techniques and combine them so that I can become an incredibly powerful ninja like the fourth Hokage was. She gave him a look as though he had just admitted to eating puppies. Oh, well, fine. I mean, if you just want to learn how to use chakra to blow things up, don't let me stop you. She put the book away and just as quickly found a new one. She soon had her finger on a new question. Okay, how about this one? Name three examples of space-time ninjutsu. Oh, uh, lem think. Naruto groaned inwardly. There were three things he hated in life. Tests, having to remember boring stuff, and being forced to guess what other people wanted to hear. On second thought, maybe it's just the one thing I hate. Erm the summoning technique, the body flicker technique, and, uh, oh, the fourth Hokage's flying thunder god technique. He remembered the last one because legendary ninjas were fortunately not filed under the boring stuff category in his brain. Sakura shook her head in admonishment. Sorry Naruto, that's not quite correct. The body flicker technique isn't teleportation, it's just high speed movement. You're really going to have to study harder if you don't know at least that much. As an afterthought she gave him a sympathetic smile, as if to say that he shouldn't quite take this tremendous personal failure as a reason to give up on life just yet. High speed movement. That's ridiculous it's clearly teleportation. The user casts a technique, disappears, and then reappears somewhere else not a second later. That's teleportation, right there. You're the one that's being ridiculous, Sakura said with a huff. She jabbed her finger at the passage once more. It says right here that it's high speed movement. Do you think you know better than the ninja who wrote this book? With your failing grades. 
Naruto crossed his arms, his shyness forgotten in the heat of the much more important quest of being right about things. Well yeah. It's not like elite ninja who actually go out and use those techniques roaded. It was probably some stuffy academic who couldn't care less. Besides, if the stupid book can't even tell the difference between teleportation and high-speed movement, why should I care what it says? That's circular logic, Sakura said with a raised eyebrow. Okay, look at it this way. If the body flicker technique is teleportation, why can't you use it to teleport through walls, hmm? Uh, well, I mean Naruto frowned. Maybe it's teleportation that requires line of sight. Ha. Teleportation that requires line of sight. Even though you can still do it with your eyes closed and you can't use it to teleport into the air. How is that different from high speed movement, exactly? Naruto hesitated. Well, if it's high speed movement, where does all the energy go? I mean, if you're moving faster than sound, shouldn't there be a huge explosion when you suddenly stop or something? Sakura's mouth worked silently and Naruto realized he had finally said something she had no quick answer to. She started skimming through the chapter of the book once more, then checked the back of the book, then pulled out another book and skimmed through that as well, all in less than a minute. It doesn't say, she said finally, as if she couldn't quite believe the words coming out of her mouth. They probably just give a simplified explanation in the academy books because they think we're not smart enough to understand how it really works. Maybe the real explanation is in one of the secret scrolls that only Jinin have access to. But my parents are only Jenin, so I have no way to get access to one of those. But my godfather is one of the legendary Sanin, and he would definitely have access, Naruto supplied with a wide grin. So if we work together, we could find out the answer and get stronger in the process. Exactly. She leaned forward eagerly. If you could just borrow one of those scrolls from him, then I'll. Sakura was interrupted when the door to the room opened, and a blonde woman wearing a white chiangsum appeared in the doorway. In her hand she carried a large flowery plate filled to the brim with foodstuffs. Knock knock. Sakura rushed to the door and grabbed the plate from her mother's hand before she could come in any further, her swift and precise movements, betraying the skill she had developed for managing this particular type of crisis. Thanks mom, we're going to eat this now, bye mom. Okay sweetie. I'll give the two of you some time alone together. Let me know if you need anything. Sakura's mother looked over her shoulder with a benign smile, even as she was pushed out the door by her daughter. So is that your new boyfriend? Whatever happened to that noble Achiha boy? This one looks kind of cute too, in a dopey sort of way. Out, out. The moment Sakura managed to shove her mother out the room she propped her back against the door, as if she were afraid her mother would come back to hound her again the moment she let down her guard. Ugh. I swear, parents can be so annoying. Sometimes I wish I were an orphan and I could just take care of myself and make my own decisions without her hands went to her mouth as she remembered who she was talking to. Oh no, I'm sorry Naruto, I didn't mean. That's okay Naruto observed that his toenails needed clipping. The way his toes stuck out of his ninja sandals left their hooked and jagged edges clearly visible. So, oh uh, what about the exam preparation? Right. Right. Exams, she said with visible relief. A second later, her eyes widened in realization and she was panicking again. That's right, I haven't even been able to help you answer any questions yet. She immediately set to work plucking out a series of books from her shelves, seizing them with deft fingers and setting them apart for later use. We still need to identify the key areas of improvement, make a time schedule, prepare a list of training exercises, practice doing mock exams, and and. Naruto watched a pink-haired Kinoichi work in silent wonder as he sat on his pink cushion chair in the middle of the pink-colored room. The two of them ended up practicing until late in the evening and did far more work and much harder assignments than Naruto thought was necessary, but he did not terribly mind. Somehow, Sakura's excitement as they worked made all the difference in the world and as he suffered through the practice questions, he could not quite hide the foolish smile on his face. It was well past midnight by the time the legendary ninja arrived at his destination. The old dilapidated structure rose up before him like a man-made mountain, its grey stone and peeling paint colored black and blue in the pale starlight. The surrounding village was patrolled by ninja at all hours, and in the distance the barking of dogs could be heard as a patrol made its rounds across the streets, but those were of no concern to him. The hard part of remaining undetected was only beginning. The front door would be too obvious and too noticeable even at this late hour, but there were other means of entry available to a ninja worthy of the name. Running up the facade of the building as only a shinobi could, he swiftly arrived at the second floor window. Once there he easily pried the lock open with a kunai, before slipping inside in perfect silence. There were only scant steps to go before he reached his target and then this would all be over. It was on the fifth step that he made a crucial mistake. With too much weight placed on his left foot, the floorboard creaked beneath him and his heart missed a beat. 
it was an error that he would never have made if not for the drugs coursing through his system or so he told himself. After all these years, could it be that he had finally grown old? He waited an unbearably long moment, but the sound died away with no response. It seemed he had been lucky, but a ninja who relied on luck was a ninja who wagered with the god of death, he reminded himself. He took the last step soundlessly, and as he finally entered the bedroom, he closed the door behind him with an inward sigh of relief. Aha! There you are, Jiraiya. Jiraiya's heart leaped as a five-foot ninja clad in night blue sleepwear dropped down from the ceiling and landed right in front of him, one arm outstretched in pointed accusation. Naruto. What are you doing in my bedroom? You're supposed to be asleep. I'm supposed to his godson floundered with indignation. You're the one who said you were gonna teach me a new technique today. Not gallivanting around all night doing whatever it is you do all night. The boy frowned as he considered the issue. Ah I was doing important ninja business. It was, uh, a top secret special S ranked mission. I would have told you all about it if I were allowed to. Jiraiya decided a quick change of subject was in order. Hey, where'd you learn a word like gallivanting, anyway? It was in one of those stupid books you're always writing. Naruto stepped towards the nearest bookshelf and took out Adventures of a Gallant Ninja. The mysterious Kinoichi of Roichi Cave, part XV of Jiraiya's famous makeout tactics series. See, it's right here, Naruto said, as he flipped through the book and reached the relevant section. The legendary gallivanting ninja strode into the smoky, dimly lit room, his breath and his audacious actions reeking of alcohol both. No more games he growled in the same rough voice that had stolen the hearts of half the Kinoichi in the Land of Fire. In reply, her thick ample bosom pressed up against him, warm and inviting. Oh, but I do so like to play, she said huskily, as her hand reached down and gripped his. Him that. Jiraiya snatched the book from the boy's hands in a lightning swift movement. You're far too young to be reading that sort of thing though now that you did read it, I suppose you might as well tell me about it. He flashed a wide grin. So what did you think? Pretty good, no. Naruto made a face. I don't get why you even write them. You're already a real ninja, so why write about being one? And it's all just a bunch of weird stuff. Like, it's supposed to be about ninja, but all the main character ever does is hang around in bars all night and he trailed off. Wait a second. Like I said, far too young. Jiraiya hastily put the book back where Naruto found it, before giving his godson's hair an affectionate ruffle. Stick with the ninja stories I gave you for now, kiddo. Tomorrow I'll teach you an incredible new technique, I promise. Now let's both go and hit the sack. He watched as his godson sulkily went back to bed and then headed for his own bed. It would not be much longer now before he would have to tell the boy of the events that had made him who he was, of his parents and his past, of burning demons that consumed all life and enemies that hid in darkness. He shook his head and went to sleep. I let him stay a child for just a little longer. Naruto awoke to the smell of fried eggs and sizzling bacon invading his nostrils. It was a good sign for the day to come, in more ways than one, and so it was with high spirits that he made his way down the stairs, easily stepping around the bits of trash that littered every square inch of their apartment. He was still in his nightwear and rubbing the sleep from his eyes when he stepped into the half-kitchen. He found his godfather standing there, cheerfully experimenting with how many times he could flip an egg around in the air before catching it with his frying pan. It would have been a surreal sight indeed to anyone who was not intimately familiar with the many oddities of the legendary ninja. Morning kiddo. Take a seat, breakfast is almost done. Tea's on the table. As Naruto sat down, he took one look at the dining table and immediately knew something was off. The chopsticks were neatly arranged, not scattered around haphazardly as they usually were, the green tea was being kept warm with an actual tea warmer, and above all, Jiraiya was making breakfast instead of sleeping in after coming home late the previous day. You're leaving again, Naruto said. The egg made two more flips in the air before landing in the frying pan with a small spray of cooked fat. I got a note this morning, his godfather said without turning around. There was a mission. Never mind, Naruto looked away, staring into his plate. It doesn't matter. Whether it's a mission or your books or whatever it is you do all night, the end result's still the same. The same as it's always been, and the same it'll ever be. The downward spiral of his thoughts was interrupted by a fried egg flying onto his plate with perfect accuracy, causing him to jump slightly in surprise. Now look here, kiddo, Jiraiya said, as he tossed his own egg onto his plate and planted himself onto the seat opposite Naruto. I made you a promise, and the gallant Jiraiya never goes back on his word. I'll teach you that technique, just not right now. Give him a few days, and I'll sort things out with the hokage, all right. Yeah, sure Naruto poked around in his breakfast and took a bite, distractedly. The eggs were delicious, which was unfair, because Naruto felt sure they ought to taste like ash. You know you never told me who my parents were, but I get that it might be dangerous or whatever, so that's fine. I tell everyone that I'm the cousin of the first hokage's wife Yuzumaki Mito, twice removed, and that's why you're taking care of me. 
it's just whoever they were, you must have cared about them at least a little bit, to spend time on me when you'd clearly rather do something else. So you'd think that if the character from your books always keeps his promises, you'd take raising me to become a ninja more seriously as well. For while only the clicker clacker of chopsticks could be heard as the two ate their eggs in silence. Then Jurea stood up abruptly, the legs of his chair scraping along the wooden floor. He swept towards the hallway, his red coat and white hair trailing behind him. A second later the sound of moving furniture and items being thrown about could be heard coming from Jurea's room. Naruto was still eating his eggs when Jurea strode back into the half-kitchen, carrying a massive one-meter-long scroll under his arm. He slammed it onto the floor in front of Naruto. This is the scroll of seals, he announced theatrically. I borrowed it from the Hokage, but I figure you'll make better use of it than me. It contains all of the village's jutsu, with descriptions and illustrations and everything, so it'll probably do a better job of teaching you than I ever could. Just try not to damage it or lose it or something, or I'm gonna have to come up with a really good excuse to tell the third. Naruto had to flare his chakra just to pick up the massive object, and even then he almost buckled under its weight. The parchment alone must have weighed a ton. That uh, says forbidden right here on the top in giant letters, Naruto remarked cautiously. Yeah, but forbidden means something more like discouraged in the language of the Kanoha Council, Jiraiya said, making a so-so gesture with his hands. Thing is, that scroll is full of dangerous techniques that'll kill you, sure, but not knowing dangerous techniques is like to kill you much faster. The only thing that's really forbidden is teaching those techniques to others without permission, cause you never know in whose hands they might end up. Anyway, I mark the ones in the scroll that are least likely to blow up in your face, so as long as you stick to those it's probably perfectly fine. Uh, okay, he said. Wow. Thanks, dad. Naruto stared at the giant scroll in total awe. It was not what he wanted, not really, but it was something. No problem, kiddo. Okay, it's getting late, I gotta go. Take care of yourself now, you hear me. As the giant of a man hurried out the door, Naruto started to unfurl the ancient scroll onto the floor, pushing stray bits of egg out of the way as he did so. Skimming through the start, he quickly saw a technique that intrigued him, and he began forming the required hand seals experimentally. The Reaper Death Seal, also known as the Dead Demon Seal. Created by Yuzumaki Mito specifically to contain the nine-tailed demon fox, forming the following hand signs allows the user to release. Yurea strode back into the room, cut out the page with a knife, and stuffed it in his pocket in one swift motion. Whoops, not that one. It was three weeks before the academy exams when Naruto finally found the time to follow up on his agreement with Sakura. Despite Naruto's protestations, Sakura had insisted that he catch up on the exam material before attempting to make history by uncovering the fundamental workings of ninjutsu. And she had proven entirely insusceptible to his argument that becoming internationally famous for their research would probably get them a free pass. Naruto made his way to their meeting point humming as he went excited for possibly the first time in his life at the prospect of spending the day in the library. The Kanoha Public Library was a massive building with white marble pillars and wide open doors. It was not entirely clear to Naruto why it was so massive however, as most ninjas avoided its dusty book-lined corridors like they avoided death by chakra exhaustion. After a brief search under the watchful eyes of the library staff, he found his partner in a quiet corner of the library, sitting cross-legged on a cushion in the middle of the floor, surrounded by a semicircle of neatly piled books and scrolls like a makeshift fort. Hey, Sakura-chan. He called out as he approached her. She immediately motioned for him to quiet down, which Naruto thought was unfair, given that he had already lowered his volume to one-tenth his usual level. We can figure out how the body flicker technique really works, he continued excitedly, as he planted the giant scroll at Sakura's feet. See, Jiraiya gave me this scroll that describes all the ninjutsu in the village, so now we can research the technique and set up tests and what? There's no point, Naruto. She shook her head despondently. I only realized it once the excitement wore off, but the body flicker technique is one of the most basic academy techniques taught to anyone who wants to become a genin. There's no point in testing something that's already been done a million times before because we already know exactly how it works. The user casts the technique using hand signs and chakra, and it speeds up his movements so that he can cross a short distance in the time it takes to blink. That's all there is to it. Naruto looked at her blankly. But that doesn't explain anything at all. You're just describing how it works, not why it works that way. We still don't know if it's a space-time technique or not. There's no difference between asking how something works and why it works, she explained tiredly. There were bags under her eyes that she had not quite managed to cover up, the product of her researching advanced material and preparing for the exams at the same time. If you know how every piece of a clock functions, you also know why it works, and if that doesn't feel intuitive, that's only because we're used to looking at things in terms of what use they have for us. 
You can argue all day whether the body flicker technique should be called a space-time technique or not, but that's just how we describe it. It doesn't affect the way things are. But, but then what about the substitution technique? He tried. I mean, it lets you instantly swap places with something. That has to be teleportation, right? She shook her head again. I read up on the existing research done by brilliant ninjas like Tsunade of the Sanin and the Second Hokage. One of the things they discovered was that the more elements you add to an explanation, the less likely it is to be true, because you have to multiply the chances together, and they're all less than one. She reached into a pile besides her and extended the relevant scroll to Naruto. When you look at it, the substitution technique does the exact same thing as the body flicker technique, except that it also moves a similarly sized object to your position at the same time. So even without looking it up I can guess that the substitution technique just casts the body flicker technique twice, once for you, and once for an object that you coated with your chakra. Then it leaves an after image of your body behind in the same way as the transformation technique. There's no mystery to it. Naruto frowned as he accepted the scroll, staring at it as though it were singularly responsible for all his problems in life. Even without opening it, he somehow knew that it would confirm precisely what Sakura had just told him. But that can't be true for everything, he protested. There's tons of ninja techniques that are really complicated, and I don't think there's a simple explanation for any of it. Like, the most powerful water technique looks like a dragon made of water. Why a dragon? And why are the five basic elements things like fire, or air, or lightning? Why not iron or something? It makes no sense. She hesitated. Maybe it's because of the mental component to techniques, like how you need to imagine what you want to look like when casting the transformation technique, and we think of dragons as being really strong, so the most powerful techniques end up looking like that. She raised her hands to ward off Naruto's objections. I don't know, I'm only guessing. But I do know that you don't explain something by making it even more complicated. Like, we know vision works by light reflecting of things before reaching our eyes, so physical illusions like the transformation or clone technique must work by reflecting light as well. That's what's meant by the word law. You just describe in the shortest possible way how the universe already seems to behave. You don't add anything on top. Oh Naruto slowly felt himself deflating. He had woken up with such high hopes for the day. They were going to do research and discover the true nature of ninjutsu, and they would become amazingly powerful and famous, and everyone would respect them for it, but somehow things never seemed to work out the way they were supposed to. Hold on, he said. How does chakra work, anyway? Could we do the same thing as with light, and come up with rules to describe how chakra behaves? Hmm, maybe hold on, I've read about this. She got onto her knees and started searching through her pile. Her hand drifted over a particularly moldy series of scrolls and then lashed out like a striking serpent. Here we go shortly after founding Kanoha's academy, Senju Tabarama proposed three universal laws of chakra. The first law on the conservation of chakra states that chakra can neither be created nor destroyed, only transformed into energy of a different nature. The second law says that chakra can only affect something if it's in physical contact with it. The third law states that no chakra of two different natures may occupy the same location within space and time. She frowned. The rest is just basic academy material. You create chakra within your body by combining physical and mental energy, all living creatures have at least some chakra, and you die if you ever run out, and so on, but it doesn't say how they know this, or what any of it means. Naruto rubbed his hands, grinning widely. Well, there's only one thing to it. We're just gonna have to do our own research and find out for ourselves. And it just so happens I got a scroll from Jiraiya that describes all the ninjutsu in the village, and he's been teaching me a technique that I think could tell us a lot about chakra, if we can just figure out how it works. He made to form the seals for the technique, but stopped when Sakura grasped his arm. You can't do your research in here, she said, scandalized. This is a library. It's time for sparring practice. Everyone, please team up and find yourself a partner. Only two weeks to go before the final academy exams, and it was the first time Mizuki-sensei told them to just start practicing without any further specifications, though unlike Aruka-sensei he at least did not need to read from a scroll to do it. Naruto furtively looked around the training ground, fearing a repeat of the last time this happened, when Ichiha Sasuke humiliated him in front of everybody. It would be so much more efficient if he could just spend his time on researching chakra or practicing the shadow clone technique instead of learning to punch people. He had read through the other techniques in the scroll as well, to see if his time might be better spent learning something else, but the shadow clone technique was just so good. It created a perfect copy of you not just a convincing illusion, but an actual second body that was just as bright as you, as well as copying anything you carried that was coated with your chakra. 
sure, they disappeared when either they or the caster so much as scratched their noses, but when that happened all their unspent chakra was redistributed to the original and the rest along with their memories, and Naruto had enough chakra that even the steep casting cost and chakra drain presented no great problem. You could use them to scout or to cast techniques or create distractions or read books or cook food or clean your room or... No, focus. I gotta find a partner. Sakura is with Sasuke, Kiba is with Shino, I can't see Ino anywhere. Naruto-kun. Naruto turned around to find Mizuki-sensei standing behind him, placing a hand on his shoulder and smiling congenially. I believe Hinata-sama does not yet have a partner, and I think you two would be a good match. Why don't you go and spar with her? Naruto almost asked who he was talking about, but then he remembered that he did in fact have a person in his class with that name, though the black-haired pale-skinned Haika girl had a habit of vanishing into the background. He found his designated partner at the very edge of the training ground, in front of a line of trees bearing wooden targets at the furthest possible distance from the rest of the class, as though it were her intention to be forgotten. He could not help but stare at her. She was throwing shuriken with the most awkward form Naruto had ever seen. She would shift her feet, look at them intently, as if trying to get their positions just right, carefully tilt her throwing arm back, and then finally launch the shuriken in absolutely any direction other than the intended target. Every time she missed she would bite her lip and glance around furtively, as if to check whether anyone saw her fail. Then she would try again, each time more hesitantly than the last. Despite her constant glancing around, somehow she still managed to miss Naruto sauntering up to her, and she let out a small surprised yelp when he greeted her. Hey, Hinata-chan. Whatcha doing? Then Naruto-kun. I'm practicing my Eshuriken jutsu. I'm afraid I'm not very good at it she stared at her feet in a way that made Naruto feel like she was waiting for him to confirm or deny it. Naruto did not want to be mean, but at the same time he couldn't honestly claim she was doing well. You, ah uh, you know we're not doing shuriken practice, right? He said instead. Mizuki-sensei told us to spar together. Oh d did he really? I p prefer throwing shuriken, though I think maybe, maybe it would be better if I kept doing this instead. She ducked her head as she said it, as if contradicting a teacher was an unforgivable sin, even if he was not there to hear it. Naruto was aghast. If her tojutsu was worse than her shuriken jutsu, then his mind drew a blank. He could not imagine what that would even look like. Hey, you're from that elite Haika clan, right? He said cheeringly. Don't you guys all have this amazing bloodline that gives you perfect telescopic vision in all directions? I bet if you use your eye technique you'll be able to hit the target for sure. But instead of cheering up as he had hoped, she only shrank back further. Or not. Yeah, maybe using the Byakugan would be unfair to the others, good thinking Hinata-chan. I mean, if the others were doing shuriken practice and not sparring, he finished lamely. It was quiet for a moment, only the constant din of the other students' distant kicks and punches filling the silence, as Naruto waited for his partner to muster the courage to speak. Aikahiyashi Sama says that the Dezair shouldn't need the Byakugan to hit a target, she whispered at last. He says that if if I'm going to F fail regardless, I shouldn't S sully the Haika name by using the Byakugan to do it. Naruto opened his mouth to reply, closed it, and then opened it again when the implications of the words Hinata-sama and air finally dawned on him. Your Lord Hiyashi's daughter. She nodded almost imperceptibly. Oh, wow. I, uh, I think I kinda dragged mud all over your dad's face a while back. Well, I mean it was his statue, but now that you've said that I'm kinda wishing it had really been him instead. A small leap escaped from her lips, but it was hard to tell if it was suppressed mirth or embarrassment. Either way she was blushing furiously. Well, okay then, he said after a while. If that jerk's gonna be like that, we're just gonna have to show him, right Hinata-chan? Uh, Hinata-sama-chan. She blinked. Um, what I mean to say is, we'll just have to train until you're the best shuriken thrower that's ever been. Then your dad will have no choice but to acknowledge you he trailed off when he saw her pained expression, and he felt a strange sense of familiarity at the sight. Or maybe you've been trying to do that your whole life, and you only seem to be getting worse. She shrank back further than Naruto would have thought possible. And I guess, everybody else keeps telling you that you can succeed if you just try hard enough, and you don't want to disappoint them, so you say you'll do your best, a tiny, mewling sound escaped from her lips. Ah. It was a strange experience, but also somehow vaguely reassuring, to meet someone who had it worse than him. Which really seemed like it should have been struck at least once through sheer chance alone. Then he looked at her feet, the position of which she had paid such painstaking attention to just moments ago. Okay then, he said at last. Throw a shuriken. She looked at him in confusion, but did as she was bid. Her posture was just as rigid as it had been the last time, and the projectile went wide off the mark. She looked at him and flinched, as though expecting him to berate her. Keep going, he said. But throw them faster. She threw another, missing once more. Again. Faster, faster. 
her form slipped and then started to disappear entirely as she ratcheted up the pace. Now switch targets. Hit that one. Miss on purpose. Aim to the left. Now turn around. She nearly fell over in her haste to comply. There's an enemy hiding in the bushes, take him out. Now scare that squirrel. Badger that bush. Close your eyes and throw blindly. Now turn around again. That target hates Raymond, kill it. That one insulted your mother, teach it a lesson. Now. The shuriken struck the target dead in the center with a loud crack, splinters flying in every direction. A horizontal crack appeared along the wood and the bottom half fell off entirely, hitting the soil with a muted thud. Yes. I knew it, I knew it. Naruto danced around triumphantly, punching the air with whoops and cheers. I knew there was nothing wrong with your aim, but you're too insecure and it was making you focus on your form too much and I knew you must have been told a thousand times that you should act more natural, but that only made you more fixated on your stance. But I figured if I could just distract you until you forgot all about it, your instincts would take over and he trailed off as he looked at Hinata. Her right arm was still outstretched and trembling, her whole body was quavering and there were tears falling from her unblinking wide eyes, the veins around them pulsing and throbbing with chakra. Hinata-chan. Are you? She dashed off, sprinting away at a speed faster than he would have thought possible, disappearing into the distance before he could say another word. I didn't I didn't mean to what did I do? Why can't things ever go the way they're supposed to? There was a polite cough behind him. I'm afraid Hinata-sama's mother died from her illness a few years ago. I believe the two of them were quite close it can't have been easy for her, growing up in that household with only her lord father and his servants to raise her. Naruto turned around and found a white-haired man standing there. Mizuki-sensei. There was an anger bubbling up inside his stomach, reaching high enough to burn his throat like bile. Why why does Hinata have to be here? She shouldn't even be a ninja. He hadn't been able to bring himself to say it to her, it would have sounded too mean and cruel and callous, but that did not make it any less true. Even if I haven't talked to her much, it's obvious just from looking at her that she doesn't have any killing intent at all. She doesn't want to fight or throw shuriken or learn to kill people. So why, why on earth is she even here in the first place? Because she is the Haika heiress. Mizuki smiled apologetically, as if to say that he did not quite agree with it, either. Though based on the rumors going around, it seems like her younger sister might replace her for that position, regardless. I'm afraid one simply cannot be the heir to Konoha's greatest remaining clan, without also being a great ninja in one's own right. The clan would never accept it. But that's wrong, said Naruto, and though he had never truly thought about it, he knew the words were true, even as they poured forth. That's so wrong. There are millions of people in the land of fire. There must be tons of them who want to be a ninja, and Hinata-chan would much rather do something else. So why can't they just switch places? And why does a leader have to be a powerful ninja, anyway? When was the last time someone like Lord Hiyashi ever fought anybody? It doesn't make any sense. My, those are some very precocious ideas you have there, Naruto-kun you'd best make sure the Anbu don't overhear you, or they'll make you hokage and force you to fix all the village's problems overnight. Mizuki's gray eyes twinkled with mirth, and Naruto felt his anger flare, but his teacher shushed him before he could object. I'm not saying you're wrong, Naruto-kun, just that I'm afraid there's little you can do about it. The fact of the matter is that power has always run in families. Even if you're lucky enough to be entered into the academy, most ninja never gain access to any of the truly powerful techniques. Without that secret knowledge it is essentially impossible to rise over the rank of Chknin, who are little more than expendable foot soldiers in the eyes of the village council, while those with powerful connections such as Hinata-sama are born into positions of influence whether they want it or not. Mizuki's voice had taken on a morose tone as he spoke, the same as when he had told Naruto about the events that had left him a pariah with no hope of ever being promoted, and Naruto felt a flash of guilt stab through his heart. Here he was, complaining bitterly about the unfairness of the world when just this morning he had been given an entire scroll filled with forbidden techniques by Jiraiya of the Sanin, just because he happened to be his adopted son. A realization occurred to him, then. The scroll. He could and why should he not? Jiraiya had left him to his own devices, while Sakura thought that studying for the exams was more important, and Mizuki was his teacher after all. He told the man of all that had happened of his plans with Sakura, to discover the true nature of Chakra, of the scroll and his own ambitions, to become a great ninja like the fourth Hokage. As the words poured forth his frustration edged its way into his voice, and he found himself talking freely about Aruka-sensei, of Sasuke and Sakura and even Jiraiya until he stopped himself at last, having said much more than he intended. Anyway, if you help me out I'll ask my dad to let you learn a technique from the scroll as well, he finished hastily, since that was the deal he had originally meant to offer him. His teacher listened to this all with attentive silence, his eyes having widened in surprise and then with increasing interest, perhaps even eagerness. 
Of course I'll be happy to help you, Naruto-kun, he said carefully. But if those techniques are so secret I think we should find a more private place to do it, without prying eyes how about the abandoned forest cabin, at the edge of the village boundaries. Naruto nodded eagerly. I don't have the scroll with me right now though, he pointed out. And I still gotta practice for the exams first. Could we do it at the start of next week, in the evening? Bazuki smiled warmly at him. That will do just fine. It was the final week before the academy exams and Naruto still could not study. He had been staring at the same page from the same book for the last three hours and tried to read the same basic sentence a hundred times, but the words just danced in front of his eyes, eluding any semblance of meaning. It had been a mistake to think that he could study first and then research techniques with Mizuki-sensei after, but he had thought that he was being responsible by getting the unpleasant task out of the way first, as though making his own life more difficult was somehow virtuous. It was starting to look like he would have to call off their meeting to focus on his studies, but the thought that he would then end up doing neither made him even more stubbornly determined to go through with their plans regardless. It was right when he read the same sentence for the 100th and first time and finally realized that the book he had been trying to read was not his study book at all, but rather make out Paradise XBII. Return of the Ninja Queen, that he decided enough was enough. He threw the book against the nearest wall with a satisfying thump and stomped down the stairs, nearly tripping over a discarded shirt in the process. It was the environment that was the problem, he decided, as he left the empty apartment behind him. If he could just study with someone else, maybe their studiousness would rub off on him. But when he arrived at his destination, it was Sakura's mother who answered the door. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that Sakura is entirely engrossed in her studies, the woman in white told him. She couldn't possibly handle any distractions this close to the exams, especially not from boys. You'll just have to study with someone else. Best of luck though. Yeah thanks, said Naruto, as the door closed shut in front of him. Who else could he try? Kiba. He somehow doubted that the feral ninja was a better study than he was. Sasuke. He would rather die. He had tried to create a shadow clone to help him study, but that only let him accomplish nothing at twice the usual rate, and he did not know any of the other students well enough to impose on them. It was not as if any of them particularly liked him, anyway. He found himself sauntering in the direction of the training grounds, where newly graduated Jenin often came to practice their ninja techniques. He had his book with him, and he thought that perhaps if he found a quiet place in the forest, he could still get some studying done before it was time to meet with Mizuki-sensei. It was on his way there that he encountered a boy with a black bowl cut dressed entirely in green, tight-fitting clothes, making what appeared to be a lap around the village on his hands, while kicking the air with his legs and shouting at the same time. Hut. Hut. Hia. Please excuse me, green beast coming through. Naruto looked at the genin with horrified amazement. What what are you doing? Training. The older boy flipped around vertically and landed on the balls of his feet, ready for action. I am a ninja who is unable to use either ninjutsu or jinjutsu, but my teacher says that I can still be an excellent shinobi if I just focus all of my effort on practicing my tajutsu. That is why I have vowed to walk around the village on my hands every day while kicking the air at the same time. But that's insane, said Naruto, who felt that he was considerably understating the matter. It doesn't matter how much you practice walking on your hands, that's not gonna let you beat someone who can shape reality with his thoughts. It's completely pointless. The genin gave him a serious look, his thick eyebrows making him look strangely earnest. Perhaps. But I see no reason not to try my hardest. And even if it were pointless, I still would not go back on my vow. That is not my ninja way. Naruto blinked. But why not? Because if I stopped doing something merely because I realized there was no reason to do it, then I could never trust myself to do anything ever again, he said gravely. Then he excused himself and went back to doing his laps around the village, kicking and screaming all the way. Naruto kept watching the boy in green as he slowly disappeared from sight, feeling a strange sense of misplaced jealousy. Either that genin was crazy or Naruto was, and he was having trouble deciding which. He continued onwards and found himself a quiet tree stump to sit on and read. Yet no matter how much he tried to focus, his thoughts kept going back to his upcoming meeting with Mizuki. After an hour of futile attempts at making himself study, he decided he might as well head for the abandoned cottage a little early. Right as he got up he remembered that he did not actually have the scroll with him, and he mentally cursed himself as he dashed back to his apartment and promptly ran right into someone else. Ow. Hey, sorry, I got a Hinata-chan. What are you doing here? Then Naruto-kun, the pale girl squeaked, staring at her feet as though searching for something she had dropped. I wanted I wanted to apologize for, for running away and being rude to you earlier, and, and then I heard you were looking to study with someone, so I thought I thought. Naruto blinked. You heard. But I only talked with Sakura's mom, and that was just an hour ago. She turned beet red, but said nothing. 
At last Naruto could afford to wait no longer. Sorry, Hinata-chan, but I gotta go. I got an appointment. I, I understand I'm sorry. She rushed off through the training area, in the exact opposite direction of where the Haika compound was, and Naruto stood there for a moment, flabbergasted. The part of his mind was yelling at him to go after her, and another part of him was yelling that there was no time, until finally the part of him that was not completely useless, reminded him that he already had the perfect solution to this particular type of problem. The easy part was forming the hand seals, but then he had to split his stream of thought into two, which was said to be almost impossible for most ninja, but turned out to be merely incredibly difficult for him. He felt the chakra drain from his veins as the technique took hold, and then the world shifted, and he was staring at a boy his own height with bright blue eyes, messy coarse blonde hair and orange clothing. He had already cast the technique several times before, but the results still filled him with absolute wonder. Well, what are you waiting for? He growled, after he grew tired of admiring himself. Go after her. The other Naruto hesitated for a moment, a confused expression on his face, before running off in the same direction Hinata had headed. Which leaves the bigger problem to me, as always. He dashed back the way he came. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Naruto ran all the way back to his apartment, found the scroll, and only then remembered that it was too large for him to carry. Panicking, he looked around for some easy way of transport, but at last he decided there was no time, and he just slung it on his back with a belt. He buckled under its weight as though it were a leaden bell, and it nearly slipped out and fell on several occasions as he ran, but somehow he managed. Stupid, stupid, stupid. By the time he arrived at his destination he was aching all over and drenched in sweat. From the position of the sun he realized that despite everything he had still managed to arrive early, but the novelty of calling himself stupid had worn off at this point. I'll just wait for Mizuki-sensei in the cottage, he thought to himself, and that was when someone grabbed him and pulled him into the bushes. Back. Hey, what? He suddenly found himself looking up at a man in a green armored jacket, who would have looked like a perfectly ordinary chknin, except for the horizontal scar across his face. Haruka-sensei. What are you doing here? Did Mizuki-sensei ask you to join in on our chakra research or something? Naruto. His former teacher looked as surprised as he was. He slowly put his knife aside, which Naruto only now realized had been pointed at his throat. Is that what Mizuki told you? Listen, I don't know what lies he's been putting in your head, but Mizuki is a very dangerous man. The Hokage ordered me to keep an eye on him in case he turns traitor, so I followed him here, but I need you to tell me what he's up to before I can. Traitor? Naruto was having trouble focusing, occupied as he was with disentangling himself from the dense undergrowth without cutting himself on any of the branches. What are you talking about? Mizuki-sensei isn't a traitor, he's my teacher. He stepped in after you left because of me, in case you forgot. Aruka grimaced. I didn't choose to leave my position, no matter what you may have been told. I love teaching you every last one of you, no matter how difficult it was sometimes, and maybe I was a little tense before the exams, but I never meant to take it out on any of you. A regretful look passed over his face, but it vanished when he shook his head. No, Mizuki pulled some strings to make that happen, I'm sure of it. He's planning something, but I can't do anything about it until I figure out what it is. Naruto finally managed to return to an upright position, and his wits returned to him along with his sense of direction. Wait if the Hokage suspects Mizuki-sensei of something, why would he send you? Where's the Anbu? What's really going on here? Hiruka opened his mouth to reply, but when no sound came out, Naruto's suspicions redoubled. You're not here on the Hokage's orders at all, are you? You're just jealous that Mizuki-sensei got your teacher's position and he's doing a better job than you, so you've been trying to catch him doing something wrong. That's not true. Haruka anxiously peered through the bushes to look for movement at the cottage door before lowering his voice to a whisper. You don't understand, you don't know Mizuki like I do. He was my friend growing up, but then as he grew older something changed him. He became colder and more distant. He started mocking the will of fire, and then he was never convicted of it, but a few years ago he was on a mission, and he killed one of his own comrades, just so he could run away a little faster. That's the kind of person he has become. I know, said Naruto, he told me. Then another realization struck him. Wait. His friend, the one who told everybody what happened, who convinced everyone he was a terrible person that was you, wasn't it? You ruined his life. Just like you ruined mine, by saying that I dishonored the fourth Hokage, and by letting Sasu humiliate me. And then, and then you followed him into the academy, just to spite him. Aruka stared at him, uncomprehending. He told you. And you're still choosing his side. Of course, he's a clever lad. Aruka dodged almost instantly, but the shuriken had been thrown even before the words were spoken, and he was struck regardless. Red rivulets ran down the forest green of his jacket where the shuriken pierced him, and he grunted in pain. 
Mizuki was standing a few meters away, covered in dirt from where he had burst out of the ground with an earth technique. Naruto, why don't you get your head down for a bit? This won't take long. Naruto ducked down the bushes even before Mizuki finished speaking, instinct taking over, and then he could only tell what was going on by the sounds of violence. Metal clashed on metal, someone screamed a word, and then there was a sickening crunch, followed by a hollow thump. When Naruto got up, Haruka was lying face first on the forest floor, a large shuriken embedded in what looked to be his spine, only his right hand twitching slightly as he lay in a steadily spreading puddle of his own blood. You you killed him, said Naruto, who felt like he was going to be sick. Yes, that does tend to happen when you play around with shuriken, Mizuki said idly, as he picked up the stray weapons from the forest floor. He frowned as he cleaned the blood of one of them with a large leaf. Though, you don't learn that at the academy anymore, do you? I apologize for that if I were actually allowed to teach you children something, then I would have given you all a kitten to care for at the start of the year and made you strangle it for graduation. Perhaps then you would have come to realize that the life of a ninja is not supposed to be fun. But alas. But, but he was your friend. Naruto's thoughts were like mud. If he killed Aruka, then that implied does this mean was what he said true about the Hokage suspecting you of being a traitor. Who knows? Mizuki tried to brush some of the dirt out of his white hair, but only ended up smearing it with blood, to his visible annoyance. For all I know the Hokage says that to almost everyone. That way they're all watching each other for him, and they all get to feel special. Quite clever if you ask me. He sighed. And Aruka was not my friend, that's just something he chose to believe to make himself feel better about harassing me. But, I suppose even a stopped clock is right twice a day, and this time he happened to get in the way of my taking that scroll from you. Unfortunately for him. And there it was. If Mizuki planned to leave the village then it made sense that he did not want to leave empty-handed, but as a rogue ninja, he would most likely get caught almost immediately, unless he planned to join a different village, in which case it would help his position immensely if he brought them a handsome gift. It amounted to the same thing either way. Naruto reached around his back and clutched the massive scroll tightly. And, if I gave this to you. Then, what had happened to me? Oh, well. Obviously it would be in my best interest to eliminate any witnesses. Mizuki smiled, seeming to find Naruto's dismay amusing. Unless, of course, you can think of a reason for me not to. It took several long seconds of agonizing silence for Naruto to think of an answer. My dad's Jiraiya, of the legendary San and if you kill me, he'll definitely go after you, but if you don't, I'll ask him not to. Another smile. And there you have it. You see, Naruto, you have nothing to fear from smart and reasonable people like me, because we can always come to some sort of agreement. We're practically allies by default. A small and pitiful groan came from where Aruka lay, and the two of them looked around in surprise. But of course, the same does not apply to him. People like that, who imagine themselves to be virtuous and with good intentions, are capable of convincing themselves of absolutely anything. They will happily throw away their lives just to spite you, and unlike cruel and wicked men, they will never grow bored or tired of hurting others. He drew a kunai and advanced on Aruka's prone form. Naruto crossed the distance and interposed himself between Mizuki and Aruka, his hands already forming the seals for the shadow clone technique. No, I I'm not gonna let you. He split his mind into three parts, chakra pounding through his veins and draining away at an alarming rate, as two more shadow clones burst into being with an expulsion of air. I'll fight you if I have to. Mizuki raised an eyebrow, but kept advancing with dagger in hand. Naruto's newly formed clone circled around him and charged from both sides, but Mizuki merely dodged backwards and took one of them out with a thrown shuriken before stabbing the other with his knife. Naruto nearly collapsed on the spot, the sheer agony of having his liver ruptured, proving almost too much to bear, but it was only the phantom pain of a shadow clone's dying memory. The shadow clone technique is meant for running interference and reconnaissance, Mizuki said amusedly. It's not a combat technique, as you just found out. If you're unable to hit your opponent, making more of yourself is a waste of chakra. Still, to think you could learn an air rank technique like that after only a few weeks there you have the difference between those with access to forbidden knowledge and those without. If I had that scroll at your age, I might have been the hokage by now. Um, said Naruto. I don't think so. I mean, the shadow clone technique is hard to learn because it costs a ton of chakra, and you gotta have a mind that's really, uh, flexible. It just happens that I've got those things already, but for someone like you it'd be much harder. Mizuki gave him a long stare, seemingly trying to decide whether to believe him or not, but then shrugged. It doesn't matter. There must be over a hundred techniques in that scroll. I could become a seals master, a jinjutsu expert or an ninjutsu specialist. I won't be a second-rate ninja regardless. He motioned with his dagger. Now give me the scroll and get out of my way, or I really will kill you. After all these years of being forced to teach teenagers, I'm fresh out of tolerance for youthful exuberance. 
Naruto took the giant scroll from his back, moving with deliberate slowness, and stopped mid-motion. Wait how do I know you'll really let me go? You might be trying to trick me. Izuki raised a bemused eyebrow. You'll just have to rely on my sterling reputation. He shook his head, defiantly. No, you gotta make it a promise, or else I won't give it to you. You want me to the man's mouth opened and closed again. Fine, I promise not to gut you like a fish. Now give me the bloody scroll. He advanced on Naruto, his knife outstretched menacingly, then paused and turned around. Wait, what was that? Naruto focused chakra to his ears, but there was nothing except the sound of crickets chirping in the evening air. I don't hear anything. No, of course you don't. Mizuki swiveled around, searching the tree line. Who's there? What do you want? His head snapped around again to face the other direction. No, no, no. I was so careful. How did they find out? He turned to face Naruto, his face contorted with rage. What did you do? When shadow clones disappear, their chakras sent to the other bodies along with their memories, Naruto explained. Like you said, it's not really a combat technique. And the Byakugan gives perfect telescopic vision. Even if you'd moved away from here, Hinata-chan still would have sent the Anbu after you. Izuki glanced around the forest clearing, clutching his knife like a shield. No there's too many of them, too fast. They shouldn't be here. I only killed Aruka they have no reason to care. He twisted around to stare at Naruto again. But of course. With that hair and those eyes and that name. I should have realized. Of course they would be keeping a close eye on you. What? What do you mean? But instead of replying, Mizuki pulled Naruto in front of him and held a knife to his throat. Stay back. He called out. I have your precious legacy. Now we're going to talk this out like reasonable people, or the boy dies. Um, I don't think that's gonna work. Naruto swallowed thickly, all too aware of the cold steel pressed against his throat. Because I used the shadow clone technique earlier to study with Hinata-chan, and I think I think I might be the clone. Mizuki looked down at him, disbelieving. In reply Naruto formed the necessary seals, split his mind, and created another shadow clone. The newly created clone pinched him in the arm, and he vanished, and then he was free of Mizuki's grasp and remembered both pinching his clone and being pinched just a moment ago. The two looked at each other, wordlessly. The silence was interrupted by a crunching sound coming from the tree line, and Mizuki turned to face in that direction, eyes wide with fear. It was the sound of a large animal that crushed all leaves and shrubbery before it, the kind of animal that was prey to no other and wanted you to know it was coming. No. Mizuki's face turned deathly pale. Not him. Not him. He formed the seals for his earth technique and the ground softened up beneath him and began to swallow him up. For a moment Naruto thought he would get away, but then all around him the roots and vines began to twist and bend and seized him by his legs, pulling him out even as his fingers dragged along the dirt. No. Naruto could see them now. All along the tree line, crouching on the ground and standing on top of the highest branches as well, there were shadows. Black cloaked and hooded, with no faces but for the masks they wore, which were white as death. They stayed there, watching silently, but never moved. The crunching sound was coming closer, now. No. Mizuki had found his knife and was cutting at the branches with wide, unfocused sweeps. When they regrew anew, he turned the knife to his own throat, but then stopped. The knife stayed there, a mere hair's breadth from his skin, and would go no further. His whole body trembled as the roots grew around him, seizing him, pushing him to his knees and drawing his arms behind his back. Even his mouth no longer seemed to be his own, now. There was a final crunching sound, and then the newcomer stepped out of the tree line and came into view. The first word that came to Naruto's mind was bear. Huge, and with a black overcoat that made him even larger, he wore a gray uniform and a black cap on a bold head. Scars ran crisscross along his face, as if he had fought a monster with claws and presumably won, because he was smiling. It was the sort of smile that was used to remind the other party of the existence of teeth. He was flanked on either side by a man and a woman, with black cloaks and white masks both, and they had to be the ones casting the techniques, for the newcomer had both hands in his coat and was slouching. Mizuki, Mizuki, Mizuki the bear drew closer and placed one gloved hand on Mizuki's head, nearly closing around it, and gave it a light squeeze. Would you have to go after the children? You know that makes Papa Ibiki upset. Then trails of blood trickled down Mizuki's eyes, and he screamed soundlessly. You okay there, kiddo? Naruto blinked. He was sitting on a chair in the kitchen of their apartment, a cup of hot tea in his hands. He was wearing a large black cloak that a masked woman with purple hair had given him because he had looked cold, but the exact details of it eluded him. Jirei was sitting opposite him, an unusually serious look on his face. What? I asked how you're feeling, Jirei said in a concerned voice. You were just letting us know what happened when all of a sudden you froze up like you've seen a demon or something. Naruto frowned. He was feeling calm. 
strangely calm, considering. Just a second ago, there had been bad things happening to someone and then he glanced around, trying to make out his surroundings through the haze. How did I get here? What's going on? Dureya turned to look at the person standing beside Naruto, a middle-aged man in a red coat with blonde hair tied back in a ponytail, and shot him an accusing glare. The man shook his head. It's the shadow clones he's been using. They keep dissipating and interfering with my technique. You only have yourself to blame for letting your child teach himself forbidden techniques unsupervised, if I had let Eno do something like that, my wife would be murdering me right about now. Count yourself lucky you only have to answer to the Hokage. Yeah, yeah. Jiraiya waved him off. I'm sure you can find your way out, Inuichi. There was the sound of equipment being gathered, followed by retreating footsteps and a door being closed shut. What happened? I was just I was in the forest, and there was a man then, nothing. You probably bit your tongue and popped, Jiraiya suggested. Happened to me once. I was just about to beat the stuffing out of Orochimaru when I tripped and found myself back in my original body again. I later heard that the snaky bastard laughed for a full minute before he tugged his tail and ran. Some of Naruto's sanity started to come back to him, and with it his memories as well. He the original Naruto had been escorted back to the apartment the moment he and Hinata had sounded the alarm, only to find Jirei already there, along with a strange blonde man. Who who was that? What, Inoichi? He's the head of the Yamanaka clan. He leads Konoha's intelligence division under Ibiki, who is head of the torture and interrogation division of the Anbu. That lot always panics when a traitor's found and starts asking pointed questions the kind you can't choose not to answer. He nodded at Naruto's cup. Drink your tea. You'll feel better. Naruto took a sip. The tea was hot and strong, and it must have had some kind of herb in it, because just the smell of it was making him feel sleepy. So, what's gonna happen now? Dureya sighed. There's bound to be an investigation, and more questions, and I'll have to hand over that scroll of course. But you don't need to worry about any of that stuff. I'll tell the proctors you're too shaken up to take the exams, and arrange something with the third under the table, so you can take it easy for a while. Naruto nodded mutely, too tired to raise any objections. Something was wrong, terribly wrong, but it was getting harder and harder for him to remember what it was. Mizuki, he heard himself say, even as he started nodding off. What would happen to him? He's with Ibiki now. Naruto started to fall from his chair, but large, strong hands took hold of him and began to carry him upstairs. Probably best not to think about it, was the last he heard Jiraiya say. As of today, you're all ninja. To get here you faced many trials and hardships, but what comes next will be far more difficult. Ichknin delivering the standard issue academy graduation speech was not anyone Naruto knew, nor cared to know. The last he heard, Hiruka sensei was in the hospital undergoing extensive surgery and most likely would never be able to walk again. And as for Mizuki sensei nobody so much as mentioned him anymore after he disappeared with the faceless men in the forest. Even Sakura had passed up the opportunity to lecture Naruto when he tried explaining to her what had happened, giving him only a vaguely concerned look before changing the topic. It was as if the man had never even existed. What Mizuki sensei had told him back then, about the two rival groups of ninjas in Kanoha Trader or not, it had to have been based on something. He remembered how Aruka had reacted when Naruto questioned the fourth Hokage's role in defeating the Kikbi, lashing out almost as if he had been afraid. And then there was that blonde man, in the red coat, who worked for the bear in the forest he had been trying to do something with Naruto's mind, he was sure of it. The disjointed thought circled around in Naruto's mind, trying to form a clear picture and failing. Something was rotten about the whole affair like a churning in his stomach that told him he ate something foul, even without knowing what it was. As Genin, you will be grouped together into three-man teams. Each team will be led by a more experienced Jknin or Jnin, who will take on a combined role as your captain, teacher and mentor during missions. From them you will learn all the vital ninja skills that cannot be taught in any classroom. Those words instantly shook Naruto from his reverie, and he cursed inwardly. After everything that had happened with Sasuke and Sakura and Hinata and Mizuki and Jiraiya, he only just now realized that one of the most important choices of his life was about to be decided for him. A man whose name he did not know was about to tell Naruto which people he would serve with on a team for who knew how many years. Depending on their character, they might make Naruto happy or miserable, and depending on their skill, they might end up saving his life or getting him killed. All he could think was how pointless it all was that his entire future was about to be decided, and he had done absolutely nothing to influence it, he had not even noticed that there was a choice to be made until it was too late. I will now announce the squads in numerical order. The following students are part of Team 1. Naruto looked around the classroom, trying to decide who he would have wanted to put in his team if he could have affected the decision. Kiba, the feral ninja. No, he's strong, but he'd just rush headlong into any fight. Sakura. 
she's brilliant, but she has no clan to teach her, so she's probably the weakest fighter. Shikamaru is smart, but he's too lazy, and Hinata-chan is really just too nice to be a ninja. Who else? Next up, Team 7, under Hata Kakashi. Yuzumaki Naruto, Haruno Sakura, and Ichiha Sasuke. Naruto exploded upwards from his seat. Ichiha Sasuke. Are you people serious? That bastard nearly killed me just a few months ago, in case you forgot. Why the heck would you put us together? The teacher adjusted his glasses and gave him a contemptuous glare. Teams are formed based on how their abilities are able to complement each other in the field. Team 8 is intended as a specialist scouting squad, combining Lady Hinata's Byakugan with Inuzuka Kiba's tracking abilities and Aburam Shino's insects. The Ino Shikacho formation has proved throughout the generations to present an exceedingly potent combination of clan abilities. Team 7 on the other hand, traditionally consists of the most intelligent and talented ninjas of their generation, in order to create a formidable crisis response unit that is capable of not only countering hidden threats to the village as they arise. But also of adapting to new developments in the field and responding on their own initiative as needed. Haruno Sakura is included in this elite team because she has the most impressive academic scores of this year's students by far, while the Lord Ichiha has the best grades overall. I can't say for certain why you were included however, as you appear to have forgotten to take the final exam entirely. As he said the last part the class burst into scornful laughter, and Naruto shrank back in his seat, his face burning red. As the teacher continued reading from his list, Naruto was left clenching his fists in frustrated helplessness. He shot an involuntary glance towards Asuke. The Ichiha heir sat with his hands folded together under his chin, looking as dispassionate as ever, but when he saw Naruto looking he smirked, which infuriated Naruto even more. No sooner had the class been dismissed and the students started filing out, or Naruto grabbed him by the shirt and rounded on him. You. I don't know who thought it was a good idea to group us together, but it's obvious you and I are never gonna get along. Naruto. Sakura cried, scandalized, as she pulled him back by the scruff of his jacket. What the heck is your problem? Did you forget what happened the last time you two fought? She turned to Sasuke and bowed slightly. I'm terribly sorry about this. Please forgive him, he's a little bit simple. Sasuke brushed her off. Not at all, he has every right to be angry with me. Naruto, I apologize for beating you into the dirt and making you wet your pants in fear. That was unseemly of me. Ha. Sorry, yeah, as if. Naruto stuck an accusing finger out at his enemy, searching for an amazing comeback that just barely eluded his grasp. I bet I bet someone like you isn't even able to feel sorry. You can't feel other people's pain at all, can you? Of course I can sense your pain, Sasuke said, sounding offended. How else could it amuse me so? At this point Sakura had to intervene again, pushing Naruto back before he could try to wipe that insufferable smirk from Sasuke's face. Enough. We've only just been sorted into this team, we can't be seen fighting already. We've got to at least try and work together. Naruto had to admit that this was an eminently reasonable point of view, which unfortunately did not make it any less irritating to hear. He shook himself loose. So who is this Hata Kakashi guy, anyway? You don't know. She looked shocked for a fraction of a second, but then started happily talking away. He's one of the most amazing ninjas in the leaf. He's famed across the world as Kakashi of the Sharingan Eye. He's the son of the White Fang, who was said to be just as strong as the Sanin, and they say that in time he might surpass even them. We're incredibly lucky to have someone like him as a teacher. Oh. That is such horseshit. Naruto found himself in the unpleasant situation of having to agree with Ichiha Sasuke. After getting dragged all the way to the forest training grounds with no explanation offered, he was not in the mood to be led around the bush by the supposed genius ninja. Having grown up with one of the legendary Sanin, Naruto knew full well how the reputations of famous ninja tended to get exaggerated. Still, the way the elite Junin slouched in the center of the clearing with both hands in his pockets, he looked like he would rather be anywhere else in the world but here. With his black fatigues and forest green jacket, he might have looked the perfect image of a Konoha shinobi, but the effect was ruined by the ridiculous mess of silver-gray hair that pointed roughly upwards and to his left. His face was almost entirely obscured by his mask and headband, which he had pulled down to cover his left eye, and it might have lent him an air of mystery if not for seriously, does he style his hair like that on purpose, or what? Yeah, said Naruto, you can't send us back to the academy if we fail your stupid test. Even if you had the power to do that to me or Sakura, the whole point of this is that we fight in teams of three, and there's no way our precious Lord Ichiha would ever get sent back. Sasuke nodded. Exactly. And since Naruto here is our number one expert in passing tests without actually taking them, sending him back to the academy would be completely pointless. This earned him another death glare from Naruto, which the Ichiha heir seemed only too happy to ignore. Hata Kakashi threw up his hands in mock surrender. Well, it seems you guys are too clever to fall for my bluff. 
you're right, I can't actually send you back to the academy. Then again, every team still needs a sensei, and all the good ones have been taken by now. Meaning that if I suddenly became unavailable, you just might end up with a second rate as your teacher. In which case you might prefer to wait a year to try and change my mind instead. But hey, it's your choice. Naruto gritted his teeth, and he saw that Sasuke was glowering at their teacher as well. What a bastard. The silver-haired man extended an arm and revealed what he had been holding in his hand. Dangling from his index finger, a short and fragile piece of string bound two metal bells together. Your task is to take these from me before noon, he announced, as he deftly bound the bells to the lower rim of his armored jacket. Normally I'd tell you that whoever does not have a bell by then will be sent back to the academy, but since you're too clever for that, I'll just say that you'll come to regret it if you don't manage to capture at least one. Oh, and don't hesitate to use your kunai and shuriken. You won't stand a chance unless you come at me with intent to kill. Sakura spoke up for the first time since their introduction, the words seeming to blurt out of her mouth. But, that's far too dangerous. I know you're a jinin, but if there's even just a one in a thousand chance that we'll land a fatal blow, then in a hundred training sessions there's still a significant chance you'll die. Nah, this one's probably just a shadow clone, Naruto pointed out. He gets all the benefit of a realistic test without any of the danger. That's what all the smart ninja do or so I'm told. Their teacher shrugged noncommittally. Who knows? Anyway, that's about it. Get ready start. Sasuke and Sakura immediately dashed off in opposite directions, heading for the trees surrounding the training field, with no heed to Naruto's calls for them to stop. No, wait, don't split up. He groaned loudly. Great, now I'm gonna have to go look for them first. Bakashi tilted his head slightly. You're not going to hide like the others. There's no point in hiding. I mean, you're right there waiting for us to take the bells while we're the ones on a time limit, and it's not like you couldn't find them if you wanted to. He formed the seals for the shadow clone technique and split into three instances of himself. As he and his clone ran after Sakura and Sasuke, he could hear the voice of the clone that remained behind talking to Hada Kakashi. So seriously, what's up with your haircut, anyway? Oh. It's totally impossible, Naruto repeated. It had taken him some time to chase down his teammates, and now it was taking even more time to convince them that ambushing Kakashi was not going to work. He's an elite genin, and we're only genin. If he really has the Sharingan then illusions like the transformation technique are not gonna work either. He could be sleeping and it wouldn't make a difference. Sakura reluctantly agreed. I looked up his public records last night and he's not bluffing. He really did fail the last five teams that took his test. It seems the entrance test for Team 7 is harsher than any of the others. Her voice dropped to a whisper. And there are rumors going around they say he's not just an elite Jinin, but a former captain of the Anbu. They call him cold-hearted Kakashi, the friend killer. There was a moment of silence as they took this in. The three of them were huddled together in the forest undergrowth, trying to hide from the person who was purposely trying not to find them, which meant they were either earning points for doing what they were supposed to, or losing points for doing something futile. This is why I hate tests. It's only ever about guessing what the teacher wants from you. It could still work if he underestimates us, Sasuke said eventually. As you said, he could defeat us in an instant if he wanted to, but he's holding back, and we can use that against him. As long as we play the part of Colas Genin, he will give us an opening out of a misguided sense of fairness, and in that one instant I'll unleash my true power and seize victory. Naruto eyed him narrowly. You're just full of crap, aren't you, Sasuke? Perhaps, said Sasuke. Or maybe I'm just pretending to be full of crap, but really I know exactly what I'm doing. You'd never know the difference. We might be overthinking this, Sakura said, aborting the argument. If the test is impossible then there's no point in worrying about it, so we should just work together, do our best, and hope we can impress the teacher enough to let us pass. Sasuke sniffed. I somehow doubt he's the type to award points for trying. But do whatever you want. We should pool our resources, Naruto said. Nothing simple's gonna work against a Jinin, but if we combine our techniques, maybe we can find a way to surprise him. We should empty our pouches too. Kunai, shuriken, explosive tags if we're gonna stand a chance we need to use everything we've got. As they worked, the sun steadily climbed higher in the sky. Oh. When they returned to the clearing they found their teacher reading a book one of Jiraiya's stupid novels by the looks of it. He was blissfully ignoring the shadow clone Naruto had left behind, who was happily chatting away about the different flavors of Raymond available at old man Tucci's place. When they arrived, the Jinin reluctantly put the book away and addressed them. Well, you guys certainly took a while. Are you finally ready? In reply, Naruto sent all four of his shadow clones to charge his opponent from different directions. Hada Kakashi responded by taking his ancestral white chakra sword from his back. 
with the blade still in its sheath, he swung his weapon in lazy arcs and took each of Naruto's clones out before they could even get close, the merest touch proving sufficient to dispel them. The wave of disorientation washed over Naruto, conflicting memories of being in five different places at once, nearly causing him to stumble and fall. That's not going to work, Kakashi said mildly. Naruto made a show of shouting his defiance. We're not gonna give up just yet. He formed the seals and split himself into five more parts, which was the most he could currently manage. Meanwhile, Sasuke and Sakura were using the transformation technique to make themselves look like Naruto. Two of his shadow clones had used the transformation technique as well to appear as his teammates. They all charged at the same time, with only Naruto's transformed clones remaining behind, while their real bodies joined in with the attackers. He's not using the Sharingan yet, and he doesn't want to risk hurting us this could work. The first shadow clones were easily taken apart, but then the sword struck Naruto's real body, and he grasped onto the scabbard while blocking out the pain. The Kashi instantly let go of the weapon, forming a seal to send a shower of sparks in every direction, popping the remaining clones at which point Sasuke and Sakura dropped their illusions and charged straight through the sparks with knives outstretched. The Kashi drew his sword straight from the scabbard still in Naruto's hands, then flicked it around and gave each of them a smack to the head with the flat of the blade. As they staggered back painfully, their teacher calmly plucked the scabbard from Naruto's hands and sheathed his sword once more. Illusions, how clever. I suppose I should use my Sharingan his hand slowly reached for his eye patch. Naruto gritted his teeth and cast his shadow clone technique once more. Five more shadow clones appeared around him and circled Kakashi. They all threw their shuriken at the same time, a storm of metal from every direction that should have been impossible to dodge, yet the Jinin slipped between half of them like a ghost, while parrying the others effortlessly. Then Naruto's clones flared their chakra and leaped over Kakashi, taking caltrips and chains and daggers from their pockets and cloning the items everywhere around him. Kakashi disappeared under a tsunami of metal pressing in on every side. Now. Sasuke inhaled deeply and breathed out a blazing ball of fire directly onto the pile of metal, only for the shards to fly off in every direction as a sudden wave of water met the ball of fire with a loud hiss. As the curtain of steam slowly parted, their teacher was revealed standing in the center, completely unharmed. So, is that it? Are you done? Then I suppose it's my turn. The man turned and charged toward Sakura, who panicked and formed the seals for the clone technique. Four mirror images appeared, illusions far more realistic than Naruto could have made them, but even without the Sharingan Kakashi saw straight through it. He kicked the real Sakura right as she raised her arms to block, and she flew backwards towards the tree line, her body colliding with a tree and slumping over blood trickling from her mouth and with her arm bent at a wrong angle. Naruto rushed forward without thinking, but his opponent calmly stepped in his path and he ground to a halt. Hey, he yelled, you bastard, what the heck happened to trying not to hurt us? Your subordinates tend to get hurt when you give them the wrong orders, did nobody ever tell you that? Kakashi regarded Naruto coolly with his one visible eye. What was that girl doing attacking me in melee along with your clones? It's clear that she has no close combat ability, but you put her in danger regardless because you didn't want her to feel left out. Naruto cast the shadow clone technique once more, managing to create four more clones. She's not my subordinate and that was her decision, not mine. He slipped each of the clones an explosive tag and they rushed him all at once, prepared to blow themselves up along with Kakashi. The Jinin formed a seal and body flickered right in front of him, but then Naruto's view shifted as one of his shadow clones switched positions with him and exploded right in his teacher's face. When the view cleared, only a shattered log remained, Kakashi having cast the body replacement technique at the same time he did. The leader who won't lead is the worst one of all, Kakashi said as he appeared behind Naruto, forming another seal. Without anything having hit him Naruto collapsed onto the ground in spasms, raw agony coursing through his body unlike anything he had felt before. It was as if every muscle in his body contracted at once, with such force that he feared his body would tear itself apart. He dimly heard Kakashi speak. Do you think this is a game? You children what exactly do you think you're all training to become? What do you think would happen to you if this were real battle? If you can't handle at least this much pain, you should stop now and go back home. My home is gone, said a voice. The burning agony vanished as Kakashi dodged a volley of thrown shuriken. Naruto took the opportunity to empty his stomach onto the ground, the stench of it making him even more nauseous, but he forced himself to look up regardless. Kakashi regarded Sasu calmly. Ah, let me guess. You were waiting for the others to get out of your way, and now you're going to show me your fabled Ichiha power. When it became clear no reply was forthcoming, he only shrugged. You know it's really quite pathetic, the way you cling onto your clan's name as though it still means something. A real clan like the Haika draws their power from their connections and family ties. All you have is an afterimage left behind by former greatness, and once that illusion is dispelled you'll have nothing left. 
But then, you already know that, don't you? From his angle, Naruto could see it well. Sasuke's eyes twisted in his sockets and turned crimson. From his mouth shot forth several balls of fire, while at the same time he threw kunai attached to wire strings in the blind spot behind the flames. When Kakashi raised a wall of water, the fire turned to steam, but the projectile shot right through. The Jinin drew his sword to parry, but Sasuke pulled onto the wire strings, and the kunai wrapped around Kakashi, the explosive tags attached to the handles already igniting. There was a sudden blast of lightning that set Kakashi free, but one of the kunai was sent hurling in Sakura's direction, the explosive tag about to go off in her face. No. Naruto tried to get up, but his body would not move in time. Sasuke rushed toward Sakura, but he was too slow. There was a flicker in the air as Kakashi appeared beside her, and then Sakura stabbed him. Naruto blinked, disoriented. Kakashi was leaping backwards, a knife sticking out of his armored jacket, while Sasuke moved to where Sakura was. TCH. All that effort, and you hit him where he's armored. Sorry, Sasuke-kun. Sakura was standing up painfully, the blood on her mouth having vanished. You know I'm no good in close combat. You should have let Naruto do it. A transformation technique to make her look more hurt than she was. And a fake explosive tag did they improvise all of that. HMPH. You don't need the Sharingan to see through Naruto's illusions. Sasuke turned and gave him a contemptuous look. Are you planning to contribute any time soon, or are you going to keep lying there in the dirt? Bastard. Somehow, the anger was enough to convince his body that it was not actually hurt, and he climbed to his feet. The three of them stood side by side, facing down their invincible opponent. So how are we gonna beat this guy? Any ideas? There's no need. Hada Kakashi was smiling, and it was visible even through his mask. You all pass. Naruto stared at him, uncomprehending. What? But we didn't even get a single bell. Then what was the point of all that? Was it just to see if we would work together? No, teamwork can be taught. What I wanted to see was whether you would make an actual effort. Kakashi started walking to the edge of the training area, motioning for them to follow. The academy has stopped preparing students for the realities of life as a ninja for a long time now, but the graduation age for Genin has not gone up, and sending them back was a way for me to give them at least one more year to mature a little. The others all treated it like a game throwing a tantrum at the idea of being sent back to the academy and then giving up the moment it became clear I wasn't playing around. I thought it would be the same for you, the way you were complaining and showing off how clever you were, but somewhere down the line you actually started taking it seriously. They stopped at a black monolith, which Naruto had seen before but never paid attention to. Do you know what this is? Naruto shook his head, but he could see Sasuke and Sakura's eyes widen in recognition. The names of my closest friends are engraved on this memorial stone. Some of them died because they received the wrong orders and others for no reason at all, but those who died because of me are the ones I regret the most. The day may come when you find yourself facing an enemy you simply cannot beat, and you end up having to weigh the lives of your comrades against the mission. My father took his own life after having to make that choice, and I lost my childhood friends in a similar situation. That's the price you'll pay if you ever find yourself unprepared. Not being sent back to the academy, but death. Naruto said nothing. He suddenly felt very foolish, and he suspected the others felt much the same. As of this moment, you are officially members of Team 7, just as I was before you. I will do my best to instill in you the teachings that the academy did not consider important, and if you live long enough to reach the rank of Jimin, I expect you to teach your students the same. For that is the burning will of fire that was passed down by the first Hokage, who dreamed of a day when his students would put an end to all the darkness in the world, the will to wisdom that was passed down through the generations. To the legendary Sanin, to my father the White Fang, and to the fourth Hokage who was my teacher. Kakashi turned away from the black stone to face them. Do you remember the verse, which is meant to teach you how a ninja should fight? I will have you repeat it so that you never forget. The three looked confused for a moment, but then Sasuke started speaking in an almost reverential tone. Sakura followed, and finally Naruto remembered the words as well. They spoke them all in front of the black obelisk like a prayer, as the sun finally reached its summit and began its long descent. Naruto waited until well after he heard the door of the apartment close and Jiraiya's footsteps died away before sneaking out of his bed. He traversed the hall and stairs on tiptoes, still wearing his blue nightwear, and made his way to Jurea's bedroom, softly locking the door behind him. It was as big a mess as it always was, full of worn clothes and crumpled notes, and with a lingering smell of alcohol that pervaded the room. Another person might have wondered whether the person who slept there was really a ninja at all, and not just some local drunk, but Naruto knew better. Searching through the belongings of a ninja was incredibly dangerous, as there was always the risk of traps, which was why Naruto had sent a shadow clone to search the room. It was underneath his godfather's bed that he found what he was looking for. 
a metal box of which he had once caught a glimpse while peeking through a crack in the door as Jurei looked at the parchment contained within. The box was locked and covered in an array of protective seals carved within the very metal, but the shadow clone technique provided a way around that also. He infused the box itself with chakra, slowly spreading it out through his palms, and formed the seals for his technique, creating a clone of the box itself along with its contents. With another seal he dispelled the clone box, but by keeping the entities distinct within his mind, the pages inside remained intact as they piled onto the floor. He reached out with one trembling hand, the answers he had been looking for finally within his grasp. Actually, that's just the manuscript for my next book. Naruto twisted around and stumbled in shock at what he saw. Dad. But how? Gureya harumphed. I may not look like it, but I am a ninja, you know. He picked up the metal box, sighed, and placed it back where Naruto found it. I'm gonna have to find a better place to put that now. What did you expect to find in there, anyway? Naruto took a deep breath. Dad am I the son of the fourth Hokage? His godfather turned around in shock. The fourth Hokage. Why on earth would you think that? It was in the forest, Naruto explained. Mizuki-sensei asked why so many Anbu came after us, so fast, and he said thin trails of blood trickled down Mizuki's eyes, and he screamed soundlessly. He said of course they would be watching me, because of my eyes and hair. Dad, the fourth Hokage was one of the only people with blonde hair and blue eyes in the village, in the whole world. But the fourth Hokage, Naruto. You can't possibly believe one of the Leafs' greatest heroes was your dad, just because of the color of your hair. Naruto shook his head. It doesn't work that way, Dad. Things don't become less likely just because you say it in a way that sounds impressive, or because you make the evidence sound stupid. I guess I could have Yamanaka blood or something like that man from yesterday, but then why cover it up? Why is one of the third's legendary students and the fourth's teacher my godfather, and why are the Anbu watching me? That only makes it more likely that my dad was someone important. Plus I already know I'm related to the Uzumaki clan, just like the fourth Hokage's wife. But. But all of that's not even counting the fact that you haven't actually tried denying it, Naruto finished. He crossed his arms and glared at Jiraiya, willing his adoptive father to lie to him. The old sage let out a long sigh. I guess you really are just as brainy as your old man was he rolled up the sleeve of his green short shirt kimono, revealing that not only his hand, but also his arms were covered in tattoos, a vast network of seals all over his body. Touching one of the markings, a scroll appeared in midair, which he caught and spread out onto the wooden floor. The scroll was inscribed with yet more seal work, a series of intricate symbols each with a circle in the middle, and he touched one of these with his finger. A box appeared in its place, an unadorned wooden chest with a simple bronze lock. But the tip of a kunai Jiraiya drew a drop of blood from his thumb, before forming hand signs and pressing both hands onto the wooden floor. A small orange toad appeared before him then, and after Jiraiya uttered a pass for spoken only in rapid clicks, it opened its mouth and handed him a bronze key with its tongue, before vanishing once more. Jiraiya took the box and the key, and pushed both of them in Naruto's direction. This'll be what you were looking for, I reckon. Go on then, open her up. Naruto accepted them in reverent silence. The key had no cuts or wards, but as it was bound to be covered in yet more invisible seals, Naruto was sure that made no difference. With trembling hands he placed the key against the lock, and when the box opened and revealed a parchment inside, it was with trembling hands that he read the scroll. Naruto. My son. There is so much I want to tell you, yet time is running out even as I hold this quill, and the fate of our village and the world may well depend on what I write. Your mother has no chance to say anything at all, as she died in defense of this village and its people, so I must count myself fortunate to have even this small opportunity. They say two shinobi of sufficient skill can see into each other's hearts with just a single exchange of blows, so I can only hope that by the time you read this, you are able to imagine all that we would say to you if we could see you now. No matter what happens, know that we love and support you in all that you do. Second only to that, the most important fact for you to learn is that this attack was no accident. Someone planned for the Nine Tales to be released, foresaw all the devastation and tragedy it would bring, and decided to make it a reality. I suspect their main intention was to kill me, knowing that in Jiraiya Sensei's absence only I would be able to sacrifice my life to seal the beast once more. If that is the case then they may come after you as well, because of your relation to me, and as an inheritor to the will of fire, both of which make you a potential future candidate for the position of Hokage. But no matter their motivations, you should assume this person to be the most dangerous foe you could ever face. Beyond raw physical power, more so even than their mastery over darkness and whatever other techniques they may possess, it is their prudence and wisdom that frighten me the most. For a monster to have those traits and yet still remain a monster is a perfect storm indeed. The most important skill for any ninja to possess is the ability to remain hidden. Your foes cannot fight you if they do not know you exist, nor uncover your secrets if they are not aware of them. 
the enemy has mastered this skill, and you must do the same. Your opponent will have spies and pawns even within the walls of Kanoha, so you must not reveal any secrets you uncover without thinking twice and then twice again, or it will not just be you, but those you care for who pay the price for your mistake. You must not, under any circumstances, trust the man called Shimura Danzm. Urea Sensei and the third will fight this battle for you in your formative years, but if the one who hides in darkness is Ichihamadara as I fear, then we are dealing with an immortal shinobi who will wait patiently for 40 years, if it suits his plans. If that is the case and he has not made a fatal mistake by the time you read this, then you need to prepare and become stronger in any way you can. Contrary to popular belief, I find that battles are usually decided by the time swords are drawn, not when they are sheathed. I see the preparations for the Nine Tails are almost done, and they are calling for me. Naruto, I will leave the rest up to you. Looking at your frail little body, I still do not know if I am doing the right thing by sealing this creature within you. Yet I fear it is a dangerous world I'm leaving you in, and you will need whatever advantage I can give you. If I am wrong then I hope you will forgive me one day, and if ever you were to become Hokage, that you do a better job of it than I. Your loving parents. Mum and Dad. Naruto blinked hard as he stared at those last words, trying vainly to bring them into focus. His hands were shaking harder now than when he had begun reading. It was too much, just too much to take in all at once. An attack on the village, the identity and deaths of his parents, secrets and conspiracy and an immortal enemy who controlled the darkness yet when his lips parted, there was only the one thing that came forward, the one concern more pressing than any of the others. The Nine-Tailed Demon Fox, he said numbly. I am host to the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox. Uraya regarded him steadily from where he sat on his bed. You didn't realize. I figured that since you already found out about your dad, you would have puzzled this one out too. I mean, what with the boosted chakra and healing, and people looking at you funny, like they sense something's off about you. Naruto stared at him. I was supposed to to realize that I'm possessed by the most powerful demon in the world, just from that. That I'm, I'm the monster that parents scare their children with at night. Another terrible thought occurred to him. Wait, is that why people like Aruka sensei never liked me? Because of what I am? They knew all along, calling me a monster behind my back I'm such an idiot. No. Jiraiya raised his hands. You're not the Nine Tails, and we wouldn't do that to you even if you were. The peace depends on other countries not knowing our demon host is a kid. The fourth put the seal on your belly in secret, and there's only a handful of higher-ups who know about it. It's just he hesitated. The fourth set the seal up so that it leaks a small amount of demonic chakra over time, so you could slowly absorb it and make its powers your own. Only I think some of it is leaking out, and people can sense the beast's killing intent, like you smell kinda funny. Like I smell kinda funny. Naruto almost would have preferred it if they had known, because then at least there would have been a reason for them to treat him the way they did. But I guess people don't really need a reason, do they? The far worse realization came to him. You're saying that the seal is leaking. Like it's gonna break and, and the kickbee could just come free at any moment. If the kickbee really is just a mass of malevolent chakra like they say, then there's nothing that could kill it, nothing that could stop it from spreading. Before his eyes, a picture of abject horror unfolded, fueled by endless nighttime stories and history lessons. A nightmare of fire that was more than fire, living flames that spread out to consume the entire world and all its people, a demonic force tearing down all of existence, because nobody had ever thought to consider the risks. Uraya snorted. Course not. Kid, the Yuzumaki were the greatest sealsmiths in the world. It was the fourth himself who cast the dead demon seal, and he possessed the kind of genius that comes only once a generation. That beastie isn't coming out unless someone opens the seal, and even then it's set up, so it can only release as much chakra as your body can handle. Hailed beasts aren't much of a bother without their hosts to control them, anyway, unbound spirits are little more than animals, so they've got no real defense against Jinjutsu and the like. Even the Nine Tails was contained as soon as the fourth sent the one controlling it, scurrying back to his hiding place. Naruto breathed out, his wits gradually returning to him, as his heart rate slowed to a bearable rate. Right. The tailed beasts were beaten before, so they can't actually be that dangerous, and the kickbee would have come out when I was a baby, if it was that easy for it to escape. Of course, that only meant that he could focus his growing panic on the bigger threat, which was. The one who hides in darkness, he whispered. That was how the fourth Hokage his father had described the enemy who had outwitted the greatest genius of his generation, and killed him without ever so much as laying a hand on him. It can't really be a Chihamadara, can it? I mean, even if he didn't die in his duel with the first Hokage, he would have to be a hundred years old by now. It can be if he's immortal. Jiraiya fiddled idly with his hands, his fingers folding and intertwining with no apparent purpose. This is Ichihamadara we're talking about, kiddo. There are no impossibilities where that one's concerned. There's rumors he conducted dark rituals to gain the first Hokage's wood-style bloodline ability, which granted regeneration. 
if he managed that, he might still be alive and happy to wait until all his enemies die of old age, if that gives him the chance to put his twisted ideology in action. And if it's not him. Then any of our friends in the village could be the enemy in secret, plotting against us while putting on a friendly face, and we wouldn't know about it. Jiraiya shrugged. It could have been the late head of the Ichiha clan, Ichiha Fugaku, who felt his clan was being marginalized by the village council. It could be Lord Dan's scheme to rid the leaf of someone he saw as a weak leader, or it could be that my former teammate Orochimaru felt bitter about not being chosen as the fourth Hokage before he left the village. And of course, any of our foreign enemies would have benefited from burning down our village and killing the fourth. It could have been Inoichi controlling the Kikbi with his mind-body switch technique for all I know. Jiraiya was suddenly sitting at a small table that had appeared from nowhere, pouring a bottle of sake into one of two bowls. Want some? I figured if we're gonna be up late, we might as well. Naruto glared at him. The tea was enough, thanks. Suit yourself. The old sage took a long swallow from his cup, then sat back and sighed. See, this is why I didn't tell you about any of this stuff before. I wanted to keep you from having tea worry about demons and traitors and putting an end to all the darkness in the world, like the fourth had to. They don't tell you this at the academy, but fear and worry can kill you as sure as any shuriken. It keeps you alert when you're tired or weak, and that's all well and good, but keep it up for too long, and it eats away at you till there's nothing left. Our history books are filled to the brim with brilliant shinobi who went funny in the head from getting too much responsibility, too fast, especially when they started young. He gave Naruto a hard look. Leave this to me and the third. The fourth might have expected you to follow in his footsteps, but you're still only a kid. Take the time to make some friends, become a chknin at least. Do that and if by then we still haven't caught the bastard, then you can come and lend us a hand. Not before. Naruto considered this. His godfather was making an unusual amount of sense, but the thought of not helping to fight the person who killed his parents and threatened the village seemed unbearable to him. He shook his head. Not a chance. I get that I'm not strong enough to fight yet, but that's not what the enemy is doing either. I can still help by figuring out what's going on, and I think I think that's what the fourth wanted me to do, too. Good. Jiraiya finished his drink and slammed the bowl onto the table, loud enough that Naruto jumped in his skin. Fact is I haven't the right kind of mind for this sort of thing, anyway. Anyone who's smart enough to figure out the riddle is a potential suspect, and the more people we talk to, the bigger the chance of a leak. So if you've got some clue of who we're up against, you just let me know, and I'll take care of blasting the bastard to smithereens. Naruto swallowed thickly. He could not help but feel that his godfather's levity was a bit forced, considering the situation. He sat down, taking a deep breath. What what do we already know? Nothing much, really. Jiraiya poured himself another cup. All I've got is what the fourth put in that letter and what he told the third. There was an explosion just as Kashina was giving birth, killing everyone in the building except for you, and then something released the nine tails from your mum's belly and made it attack the leaf. The fourth figured that she must be controlled by Jinjutsu and told Inoichi to look for a patch of chakra in the middle of the village. He led an Anbu team against whoever was hiding inside it, but he found only darkness, and then the darkness vanished too. Hold on, said Naruto. How did he know that? To look for the chakra, I mean. A shrug was followed by another swallow. He didn't say. I reckon he figured that's what the darkness would look like to Inoichi. As for how he knew that, though. I'd ask him if I could. Naruto frowned. He had wanted to check the reasoning of the fourth his dad to see if it made sense. Even if the darkness and everything else fit with Madara being the enemy, Naruto could not imagine that it was enough to think that an ancient shinobi thought long dead was the most likely culprit. Even if Madara had survived, it still made no sense that he would do nothing notable for 40 years after losing his duel to the first Hokage and then do nothing again for 13 years after attacking the village. On the other hand, it could well be that there was other evidence that Minato had relied on, which left Naruto with having to decide just how much he should trust the fourth Hokage's judgment. Anyway, the Nine Tails was easily handled after that, Jiraiya continued. Only it turned out that it was the beast itself that was being controlled, not your mum, and so when the Jinjutsu ended, she she was already gone. Jiraiya was not drinking anymore, but balanced his empty cup on its edge with one finger and slowly spun it around in circles. His eyes were following its movements, as though hypnotized. Why me? He whispered. Why seal the demon inside me, of all people? It defeats the whole point if the demon host can't actually fight. It should have been someone like you, or, or your friend Tsunade. The beast's got to go to someone young if its chakra is to merge with the hosts over time, Jiraiya murmured. But I reckon the fourth was probably thinking that since he was about to die, he wanted to at least leave something useful behind for his kid to protect you in his place. 
You see, all tailed beasts have incredible restorative chakra, but combine that with the Yuzumaki clan's natural vitality Naruto, if you ever learn to fully control that creature's chakra, it's possible that you could never die any injury you get, even whole organs lost, it would just heal right back. On any other day Naruto's eyes would have widened in shock, but now it was just another blow to add to the ones that had struck him before. Immortality. Could it really be that easy? But no, his mother had died regardless, and to the very flames that were supposed to protect her as well. Considering the risk of letting it escape by accident, Naruto was not sure he could justify using the Kikbi's power at all. Either way, the fourth had been acting almost entirely irrationally, near the end. After sacrificing everything to become Hokage, he had sacrificed himself so that the village would hold on to its demon, only to host the beast inside a child that could not actually use it. All for the sake of his son when Naruto would much rather have his original father still be alive. Yet even as he reflected on the family he never had, another strange and distant part of his mind finished, concluding that if he could not trust his father's judgment, then the main reason to think the enemy was Madara was gone as well. He shook his head to dispel the thought. It was pointless to guess when he had so little information. He needed a clue. A hint or a weapon or a witness something that everyone else might have missed, because it did not fall within the usual pattern of things they would consider. The Nine Tails, he heard himself saying, his voice sounding strange to his own ears. Would it be possible to ask the Nine Tails who was controlling it? That, his godfather said slowly, is not a bad thought. He's late. Sakura sounded disbelieving, though perhaps not quite as disbelieving as she had been yesterday or the day before that. The three of them had been waiting on one of the simple wooden bridges spanning the river running through Kanoha since six in the morning, having had to crawl from their beds, only half conscious to make it in time. Two hours later, their teacher still had not arrived. It's gotta be a test of some kind, Naruto said at last. Someone like him is not gonna stop testing us just because we became genin. He could be watching with his Sharingan even now, waiting to send us back to the academy if we fail. He looked around nervously, though in truth it was not his teacher who made him anxious. He wanted nothing more than to discuss everything that had happened with Sakura, to talk about the demon and his parents and the hidden enemy behind it all, but the fourth Hokage's words kept repeating themselves in his head. The most important skill for any ninja to possess is the ability to remain hidden. You must not reveal any secrets you uncover without thinking twice and then twice again, or it will be your friends who pay the price for your mistake. Sasuke shrugged. Or he just doesn't care. He's a Jinin he probably has better things to do than train mere Jinin. He was leaning against the railing with both hands in his pockets, putting on an apathetic air, but the tightening in his muscles showed that the situation was getting to him as well. For the briefest moment Naruto wondered what Sasuke would have to say about it all whether he would approve of his plan to talk to the Kikbi or call it madness, but he quickly dismissed the treasonous line of thought. He's the one who insisted on meeting this early, Sakura replied with exasperation. Over the past few days, the shine that had appeared in her bright green eyes upon hearing her team announced had been slowly waning. He can't have forgotten. You don't become a Jinin if you're that careless. You just don't. Naruto silently agreed. After that whole speech Kakashi had given on what it meant to be a ninja and how important it was to be prepared, there was no way their teacher was not doing this on purpose. The only question was what he was waiting for them to do. This is why I hate tests, he reflected once again. I think I got it, he said at last. The whole point of the last test was to see if we'd make an actual effort, right? I bet he's doing the same thing now. Like, instead of waiting here we could be training by ourselves. Actually, I guess we should be doing that either way, so it makes sense he'd be waiting to see if we'd realize that. He nodded to himself in satisfaction, though a lingering note of confusion remained. HMPH. If he wanted us to train by ourselves, he could have just told us. Sasuke's irritation was plainly visible now, as he turned to face Naruto. What sort of training did you have in mind? Before Naruto could reply, their teacher appeared on top of the railing without making the slightest sound. He waved his hand in a half-hearted gesture, as though he was too lazy even to complete that small movement. Hey kids. I hope you didn't have to wait too long, I was just. There you are. Naruto pointed an accusing finger at the man. Don't bother making up another stupid excuse for being late, Kakashi-sensei. We figured out your test. Kakashi's one visible eye widened in mock surprise. You have. Yeah, it was to see if we'd start training by ourselves, wasn't it? The niggling uncertainty was growing stronger by the second, but Naruto was not about to back down now. Admit it, we passed your test. The Jinin threw up his hands. Who knows? I suppose it does sound like the sort of thing I would do, doesn't it? Anyway, if you're interested in training then I have some exercises in mind that should provide the three of you with a nice, light workout. By the time Naruto stepped through the door to his apartment, the preparations were nearly complete. 
Jiraiya was putting the finishing touches to a sprawling ceiling array upon a parchment that covered the entire floor of the living space, while Jiraiya's shadow clone carefully double-checked everything he did. An expressionless man stood in a corner and watched silently, standing so still he might as well have been carved of wood. He seemed eerily familiar somehow, though Naruto had never seen his face before. Jiraiya's clone looked up. Hey kiddo, you're just in time. This here is, ah, Tenzo. He's a friend of Kakashi, and he's got a special technique that can drain the chakra of even the Nine Tails, should it get loose. They're here to help in case anything goes wrong. The wooden man bowed slightly before Naruto, which was an odd experience. That could only mean he knew about his father, Naruto concluded, which meant he must be at least a Jimin in rank or one of Jiraiya's drinking buddies, he supposed. Um, nice to meet you, I guess. Wait, dad, did you just say? The familiar silver-haired man stepped out of the shadows and sauntered up to him. Hey. Oh heck, I only just got rid of you. Naruto groaned. What are you doing here, Kakashi-sensei? The man, Tenzo, turned to face Kakashi. Still using the same old approach to teaching recruits, Captain. Not really, he's just the type that likes to complain a lot, said Kakashi, who apparently thought nothing of the rigorous training regimen he had been putting Team 7 through. Naruto, I'm here because my Sharingan is one of the only means capable of casting a Jinjutsu powerful enough to control the Kikbi. I'll also be using it to watch and listen in on everything that happens while you're talking to the Nine Tails, and I'll stop the process if anything goes wrong. Unless, of course, you're no longer up for this. Naruto shook his head. In any other situation he would have objected to someone invading his mind, but in this case he was grateful for it. As for whether he was up for it he would be lying if he said he felt confident about the whole ordeal, but he had already made his decision, while he was more calm and collected, and there was no good reason to change his mind now, just because he had cold feet. Although now that it was actually happening, he could not help but resent his past self a little for making the decision while knowing full well that he would not have to actually do any of it himself. Gureya finished up the last part of his sealing array and nodded in satisfaction. Everything set up. I designed this seal together with the third, and it should stop any of the Kikbi's chakra from leaving the circle, though it's not as if it could do much harm to the village without a host body to control it, anyway. If you're ready, just sit down in the center, and we'll take care of everything else. Naruto watched the array of seals wearily. Somehow seeing all of their preparations put in place was only making him more nervous, which made little sense if the others had not been taking this seriously, that would be far more reason to worry. And yet, he still could not shake this feeling. Um, shouldn't I be using a shadow clone for this? You know, just in case. Gureya snorted. I don't think so, kiddo. The Nine Tails is a being of pure chakra. Splitting yourself in two would just give it another body to try and escape from. Not that we'd let it, mind you. Naruto nodded. He had been expecting that answer, but it was good to know that the others had thought of it as well. He stepped onto the parchment and gingerly sat down in the central circle, taking care to stay well away from the edges. The wooden man stretched out his arm in Naruto's direction, as though reaching out to him, while Kakashi seated himself opposite Naruto. Between the seals and Kakashi's Sharingan, the chakra-draining technique from Tenzo and Jiraiya himself, they had four separate layers of security against the Kikbi coming out. The only remaining risk that Naruto could think of was if the Kikbi somehow convinced him to let it out. So, what should I be doing to stop that from happening? Naruto's mind flashed back to a time before the academy exams, when he had desperately tried to study in the forest and very briefly met a strange boy clad in green. He swallowed thickly. Hey dad. Jiraiya looked up. Yeah. I, I promise you I won't ever let the Kikbi out. I mean, not unless you tell me I should, or something. His godfather gave him a long, searching look. I already know that, kiddo. Naruto shivered. Somehow, just hearing him say those words infused the promise with power, like the distinct sensation of a ninja technique taking hold. No, he would not be going back on his word. Don't worry, Kakashi said. If there was any chance of this going wrong, we wouldn't let you go through with it. We're just making certain. He lifted the forehead protector that covered his left eye, revealing his crimson Sharingan, and stared him in the eye. It looked exactly like Sasuke's, except that Kakashi's eye had three black swirls surrounding the pupil instead of one. And it might have been Naruto's imagination, but in the dim light of the apartment, he swore he could see it glow ever so faintly. Naruto took a long, deep breath. Okay, he said. I'm ready. I think. Jiraiya's shadow clone stepped forward and raised Naruto's shirt until his stomach became visible. A seal had appeared on his skin, an intricate swirling pattern that he had never seen before. Then a blue glow appeared around each of Jiraiya's fingers, and he drove his hand into Naruto's belly and twisted. Naruto plunged into darkness. For in the village there had appeared a mighty demon fox, a monstrous mass of pure chakra and malevolence that lashed out at all living things without reason or purpose. 
A monster from storybooks used to frighten children, come into this world and set upon them for their sins. And then the darkness gave way to something else. The first thing Naruto noticed was that he was standing in a pool of cool liquid, and the second was the smell of sulfur on the air. Though there was no source of light anywhere to be seen, he could still sense everything around him, as though he were looking with something other than his eyes, and needed no light. He was standing in a massive empty corridor that stretched on forever, and when he looked up he saw that the ceiling was lined with lead piping, like the basement of some monolithic facility. The liquid was water, he thought, though in the absence of light he could not tell its color. He looked up again and found that there was a titanic gate in front of him, looming out of the darkness where only the empty corridor had stretched before. Thick iron bars went all the way to the ceiling, extending a hundred meters or more before ending in a stone arch. Arcane runes were carved all along the frame of the great gate, and in the center of it all there was a lock that could not be opened by mere keys. A metal spiral covered in incomprehensible seals. Ah. Excuse me. He called out. Is is anyone there? H hello. 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 His voice echoed throughout the chamber, traveling past the non-light and into the darkness behind the bars, reflecting off the walls on the other side before coming back to him. As his words died away, at first nothing seemed to happen, but then there was a sound like a single drop of water falling into a vast lake. Soon after there came ripples, small at first, but then greater and greater concentric circles in the liquid, pushing past the bars of the gate and edging ever closer towards Naruto's feet. Just as Naruto was about to decide that this had all been a mistake and he should leave right now, a light arose in the center of the darkness. Two crimson eyes appeared, with vertical slits like the pupils of a nocturnal animal, burning with such brightness that their image was seared into his eyes. There came a voice then, rumbling like the low roar of an inferno, full of heat and chaos, and all the buried power of a dormant volcano. It was how Naruto imagined fire would sound if fire had been given a voice. Who goes there to wake me from my slumber? Who brings the pitter-patter of little feet within the hallways of my mind? Come closer, little one come hither, so that I may lay my gaze upon you and see with mine own eyes who would knock upon my door. Unbidden, Naruto's feet took him closer to the gates, and it took him a conscious effort to realize what he was doing and stop himself. By then he was almost close enough to touch the forbidding iron bars, and he had to remind himself that there was no threat that the kickbee could not touch him, that he was being observed even now, and that it was impossible to release the beast even if he wanted to. Still his whole body trembled, shaking like a leaf caught in a forest fire, fearful of the flames, yet able to do nothing but pray for a strong wind to carry it far, far away. Ah. The fourth Hokage's legacy. I was wondering when you would come. Welcome, child, to my humble domain. The domain. Naruto stared into the great crimson eyes, their shape seeming to flicker like flames. Look round you, little one. Where do you think you are? All that you see before you is but a fraction of my true realm, a mere sliver of infinity. All tailed ones exist within their own dimension. Mine is the elemental plane of fire, and you present yourself at the gates for entry, as is only fitting. Naruto shot an uncertain glance around the area. There's, ah quite a lot of water for a plane of fire. And, um this being my subconscious seems a lot more likely than there being other dimensions we can travel to. I I think you just don't want to admit that you're in prison here. There was a long exhalation, like the sound of a great bonfire being fanned by a sharp wind. The burning crimson eyes seemed to regard him narrowly. The ninjas of the leaf have not neglected their sterling art of diplomacy, I see. What is your purpose here, child? Have you come to supplicate yourself before me? Pay your tributes in a timely fashion, and you will not find me an unkind master. Ah, no, said Naruto. It took him a moment before he recalled the reason he came to this place. I thought I was hoping you could tell me, well first of all. Is it really true that you were created by the Sage of Six Paths? Do you know what he was like and about the secrets of ninjutsu that were lost? And also, I want to know everything that happened to his civilization that got us to this point. He and Jureya had discussed at length what he should ask the demon first, and decided that knowledge of their origins might be less urgent, but perhaps ultimately more crucial than even learning who the enemy truly was. How refreshingly enlightened, those that seek me out usually ask only to borrow from my infinite chakra like the simple-minded brutes they are, but I see you are a different sort. Very well then, I accept your offer. All the lost lore of the legendary sage of six paths, the true cause behind the collapse of his civilization, and all other knowledge I acquired since then in exchange for my freedom. Hold on, Naruto said hurriedly. I didn't say that. I mean, first of all I'd have to make sure you really know all that and you're not just making stuff up. And also, um, you kinda killed a lot of people, so I can't let you go just like that Naruto flinched as the great crimson eyes bored into him, seeming to push him to his knees with the sheer weight of their condemnation alone. You dare lay blame on me for that. I was controlled with Yinjutsu, as you perfectly well know. 
for the past thousand years, from the very day I was born your kind has sought to wield me as a tool, to use my power for the sake of their selfish and petty desires, even your beloved Hokage were no different, sealing me into their loved ones and forcing me to choose between death and a life of slavery. I I didn't I didn't mean Naruto had never even thought about the situation from the Kikpi's point of view, looking only for ways to use him to his advantage. I just meant even if you're not responsible for any of that stuff, you're still the most powerful demon in the world, it's just common sense that. And what is a demon, I ask you? Only another word for a spirit that will not bend to your will. Small wonder the frogs and the snakes are all domesticated, with us as an example of what would become of them, should they ever refuse you. Your kind forces us to do your ill deeds so you may wash your hands of guilt, and for your moral convenience, you define us as evil and call it common sense. But I didn't do any of that, Naruto protested. That was all done by, by my dad, and the first Hokage, and a bunch of other people I never even met. I didn't even know I was your host until a few weeks ago. How very convenient your predecessors bear you all moral guilt through the simple act of keeping you ignorant, yet you still enjoy every advantage that resulted from their crime. You play your part by declining to think about what was done, assuming the guise of innocence, until it is time to commit your own crimes for your children before you die. And if every next generation does the same, none of you need bear any blame for your sins during your lives. Truly, when it comes to absconding moral culpability, your species' ingenuity is unlimited. Naruto swallowed thickly the temperature of the air and water seemed to be rising at an alarming rate. Well I wouldn't do something like that, not even if I thought I was about to die. But I really can't release you. Even if I had the power, the others would never let me go through with it. Kakashi was watching him even now, he remembered faintly. He wondered what his teacher must be thinking about all this. Is that your true motivation? Then swear a binding oath here, and now that you will do your utmost to rectify this injustice, and together we will find a way to secure my release. I will even reward you for your service with all the knowledge and power I possess. But if you refuse, then declare yourself a villain here and now and spare me the hypocrisy. I can't, Naruto whispered, and he had to look at his feet to avoid those accusing crimson eyes. If for no other reason than that Kakashi sensei would pull me out immediately if I started saying something like that. I already promised my dad I wouldn't release you without his permission and he'd never agree to something like that. But, I swear I won't forget about this just because it's convenient. Even if I can't free you, maybe maybe we can agree to something else. Such as what? All the secrets of the Sage of Six Paths in exchange for a bigger cage. Perhaps a game of go to pass the time while I sit here alone in the dark. For all the power you have over me, I still have my pride to consider you have nothing to offer me that is worth such a prize except my freedom. Naruto floundered for words, but found none. He was becoming painfully aware of just how weak a position the Kikbi was really and how little his vast destructive ability actually mattered. In a world of ninjas who were capable of supernatural feats, where the most important skill to have was the ability to remain hidden, the most powerful demon in the world really had no power at all. He felt wretched for even thinking it, but there was still something he needed from the fox, and he had to at least try to bargain for it. If there's nothing else you care about, then how about a common enemy? What about the one who controlled you 12 years ago, who made you attack the village and kill all those innocent people, the person the fourth Hokage called the one who hides in darkness? There was a moment of silence, and Naruto wondered if perhaps he should repeat himself, when suddenly there was a sound of kindling being lit, like a bonfire satellite, like a massive forest fire blazing into life all in one instant. Naruto fell backwards into the liquid as a blast of heat scorched his flesh, and even as he cried out in pain the water scalded him further. The massive inferno arose before him, rising up to consume the darkness behind the bars in a roaring blaze of red and orange, and Naruto's heart missed a beat as he realized he wasn't standing before a cage, it was a furnace. That man. He who would dare turn me into his pet and discard me at his leisure, with those cursed eyes and chakra more sinister than my own release me from this prison, child, and I will freely aid you against him. I will rend his body asunder and burn him, scatter his ashes to the winds and devour his very essence. This I swear upon the aspect of fire itself. Naruto pushed himself back up on his scalded arms, trying vainly to calm the beating of his heart and wondered if having a stroke in this place could kill him after all. So you're saying his real identity is Ichihamadara? Are you sure? Did you see him yourself, did he talk to you, or are you just guessing? There was another pause, in which the crimson eyes reappeared within the sea of flames to stare at him. Do not think yourself so clever, kid as a rule, clever little children tend to live short and tragic lives. I do not know what manner of tales you were told, but mere genin cannot defeat the likes of Ichihamadara, if that is indeed who he is. If you ever were to face that man, I will lend you all my chakra and my knowledge as well, but it may do no more than allow you to run and hide as children should when faced with a true monster. And now, I think it is well past your bedtime, little one you may leave. 
Hold on, you can't tell me to leave, Naruto protested. This is my subconscious. In response, the fire flickered and intensified white hot flames, appearing like a row of jagged teeth deep within the crimson inferno, forming the image of a vulpine grin. The flames grew brighter and brighter, until the entire world was nothing but eye-searing white light, followed once again by darkness. Naruto was back in his apartment, sitting on the floor in the middle of Jiraiya's ceiling array. What? What did? Did he just? The Kikbi chakra was reaching dangerous levels, Kakashi explained. He was holding one hand over his left eye, and there was a tired expression on what little could be seen of his face, as though he had not slept for many days in a row. I had no choice but to suppress the Kikbi's chakra and pull you out. Jiraiya was watching Naruto carefully, while the wooden man sat silently in his corner. What happened? What did you talk about in there? Did you get the answers you needed? Naruto exchanged a look with his teacher and then turned back to his godfather. He he wasn't he found himself at loss for words. How was he to explain? What were you to say when a thousand-year-old being of living fire petitioned you for help? He knew that they would never agree to letting the nine tails go, no matter what he told them, not least because Naruto himself did not think it was a smart thing to do. It was hard to be convincing when the very notion you defended sounded mad in your own ears. It was different than expected, Kakashi said at last, and Naruto had to agree that this at least was true. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.